be chairing this, um, I think, very interesting session on um, how the EPO is working. So after more than 20 years talking about what the EPO should be, how it should look, look like, and just thinking or hoping someday it will be uh, a reality, now we are there. And we are there with an excellent panel that know what is going on and what is uh, behind the rules and not, not that they are not complying the rules, but uh, how the rules are being applied and they are creating also the rules, um, the internal rules of procedure, which will be obviously um, essential in the day-to-day -day handling of the work and then the success of the EPPO. So um, I will stop here. Um, I only want to say that um, I'm very much honored to be chairing this, and I'm very much looking forward to learn from all of you uh, what is going on. Because um, I remember in 2002, when I wrote a proposal for a project I carried out in Germany. So it's 20 years ago. Yes, we are getting older. But uh, my proposal was um, if and whether the European Public Prosecutor's Office at that time, so um, remember 20 years ago, we didn't even expect to have um, or we didn't know if it would be real to have this institution be put in place. And my proposal was um, beyond investigating and, and handling um, economic crime, anti-fraud, institution, if the EPPO should also uh, spread its competences beyond to other supranational interests in the more effective um, cooperation in the European Union in fighting other supranational interests. So um, we are not there yet, and uh, that will be the next step for academics. But uh, now it's the moment to listen to the interventions of the presenters, the speakers of today. I will make a very short introduction of um, all of you. So um, obviously, you know all of them, and they all have a very broad professional background. And um, I will first give the word. I think we changed a little bit. There were the, or the order, so Luca de Mattei is, is talking first, am I right? So, um, um, Luca de Mattei is the head of the legal department right now at the EPPO. He's magistrate with a long career in Italy. And um, we, haven't, we haven't structured with titles and, and precise topics this, uh, this panel so that the discussions flow in a more flexible and spontaneous way so that we really address the questions that are um, as a, a crucial right now in the working of the EPPO. So, but anyhow, they have coordinated themselves and we are very eager to listen to you. So, Luca, the word, the floor is yours. And thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the Fondazione Basse for its invitation and this wonderful hospitality in this setting and for the opportunity to deal with this uh, themes, which are especially important to all of us and crucial to us. I will continue in English, but I wanted to specifically express my thanks to the Foundation. Then internally, I, uh, I ended up speaking first because what I would like to do is get out of the way. Uh, get out of the way and uh, uh, leave you in the company of our European prosecutors uh, first and then of Nicolas later uh, uh, to give you the feel of uh, 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 what it's like to be on the road with the EPO, uh, meddling in the real substance of what we do. 
I um, uh, coordinate the, the legal service of the EPO. Um, our function within the EPO, a legal service in an organization of lawyers, uh, seems like a bit of an odd uh, uh, construction. However, um, we have the task of uh, assisting the decision-making uh, bodies in the EPO, college, permanent chambers, uh, European prosecutors, in uh, the interpretation of the legal framework which applies to our work, in particular the legal framework uh, under EU law. Uh, it's being understood that uh, for the interpretation of the national framework, the European prosecutors and the deputy prosecutors are the ones best placed to do this activity and they do not need our support. What doesn't change the fact that because of uh, the situation uh, uh, that you have been described yesterday, in particular for the relevance of national law in respect of the EPO's operative work, which is uh, predominant, uh, uh, we are sometimes confronted with the need to um, uh, understand uh, how each of the 22 legal systems from a procedural and substantive criminal law point of view work because uh, otherwise uh, applying uh, the rules which do pertain to the European law parts of our legal framework becomes very difficult. I'll give you perhaps an example later. So I want to speak uh, very briefly uh, just to give you a feel of uh, um, uh, how in this uh, first uh, uh, years of, of existence of the EPO and in particular in this first uh, 100, uh, by now almost 120 uh, days of operations, our legal framework has uh, um, uh, resisted the impact of reality and of the operative work of the EPO. Um, what is our legal framework? Well, uh, our legal framework, of course, uh, starts uh, most obviously with the EPO regulation, which is uh, proving to be an incredibly complex piece of legislation to interpret with uh, um, questions, uh, quite fundamental questions arising uh, at every turn of our, of our work, uh, um, uh, including few issues which I would like to uh, give to you as questions as we have received them, discussed them internally, arrived at some uh, possible provisional conclusions uh, on which uh, action has been taken or will be taken and that of course remain to be tested against the reality of the ground, of the courts, and ultimately of course against the interpretation that eventually the Court of Justice will give of, of these of these concepts. One of which being uh, the question whether the EQ regulation um, allows an autonomous definition of what uh, the power and role of a prosecutor is, uh, or whether our European delegated prosecutors and the European prosecutors, when they act uh, 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 in their national systems with the power of prosecutors, are merely replicas of the sets of powers and competences that their national counterparts have. Uh, does the EPA regulation in particular uh, give uh, the European delegated prosecutor a minimum set of tasks and responsibilities that all of them have to have regardless of the legal system in which they carry out the work? What of course is a question of enormous relevance considering the wide uh, divergence between the legal systems in which our activity uh, is carried out, where you have uh, systems where the delegate, where the prosecutor is the center of the investigative activity and others where uh, the stage is shared with other actors, such as investigating judges. So is there in the EPA regulation something that warrants a minimum common denominator to the activity of the delegated prosecutor regardless of these differences? One of the concepts that has been most prominent uh, uh, in terms of the need to interpret it and to uh, uh, give this interpretation a meaning in terms of practical application is the concept of the single office. Um, in particular, uh, the questions uh, the, can be, uh, uh, can be uh, summarized to, to, to a main fundamental overarching one, which is... Um, when does the EPO regulation, apart from obvious cases where this is spelled out clearly, not, not many really, um, require uh, uh, attribution of specific tasks and responsibilities to one organ of the EPO rather than to another? Uh, is there a situation where uh, the organs of the EPO are interchangeable uh, when this is warranted by the need to conserve the useful effect of the regulation? And in this respect, uh, Every time that the, 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 the regulation speaks of the EPO doing something, the question arises, yes, but the EPO who? 
questions the role of the supervising European prosecutor. Uh, there's a number of issues where the EPO regulation is either silent or vague. Um, what is the exact um, boundary of uh, the role of the supervising European prosecutor when he or she uh, uh, takes over uh, uh, the uh, running of an investigation according to Article 28.4 of the regulation? Uh, is that role limited to investigation, so does it extend into other uh, um, other uh, segments of the life of, of a criminal affair? What is the role of the supervising EP vis-a-vis -vis the delegated prosecutors? How does this role, uh, uh, how is this role reconstructed? Is it a hierarchical role or is there a functional division? Um, what is the role of the supervising EP vis-a-vis -vis the permanent chambers? Um, is it necessary that the supervising EP uh, is always external to the permanent chamber in their decision-making process strictly within the limits of the powers of, uh, of the voting powers established by Article 10.9. Uh, all these questions have been asked uh, and some answers have been given, but again, uh, I pose them to you in terms of questions because I think it's more, it's more useful for what we're doing today. Um, We've spoken at length yesterday about competence. It's, I'm not going to, to take that up again now because that has been, I think, uh, debated long enough, but questions. Uh, what is the role of national criminal law in the definition of EPOS competence? Uh, in particular, uh, what is the space for the application of, of rules of national law in defining what is a conduct in terms of uh, definition of EPOS competence? What is the role of national law in defining what it means for an offence to have been committed in the territory of a member state? Uh, all these questions uh, uh, I pose to you as, as food for thought. So I'm not here to provide uh, answers. Um, the legal framework continues, of course, with the uh, offshoots of the EPA regulation in the internal rules of procedure, a fundamental document which the College approved at the very beginning of its activity one year ago, um, where, uh, based on this question and others, a number of uh, uh, assumptions were made and a number of, uh, shall we say, philosophical preconditions were transformed into concrete rules. Uh, first of all, uh, if you read the internal rules of procedure, uh, they, are, they are online on our website in all languages. Um, uh, you will see that there is a uh, 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 rightful uh, preoccupation with business continuity. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, the temporary impediment of one of the organs of the EPO shouldn't stand in the way of the EPO performing its task based, again, on the concept of the EPO as a single office. One of these, uh, one of these uh, uh, rules, just to give you one example, uh, concerns the... Uh, absence of a member of a permanent chamber when a decision has to be taken as a matter of urgency. And uh, the decision of the college in this case has been based on a concept which is, if you will, more inspired by administrative law than, than by criminal law, uh, that uh, the absence of one member of the permanent chamber, not the supervising European prosecutor, who by uh, virtue of the regulation always has to participate uh, in the deliberations of the permanent chamber, does not prevent the permanent chamber in exceptional circumstances and when it's not possible to delay uh, uh, the decision, uh, to, uh, to take a decision if that decision is taken unanimously, uh, applying a principle of administrative law of la, uh, what we call in Italian la prova di resistenza, to, uh, to verify that the presence of another European prosecutor could not have altered in terms of votes uh, the outcome of the decision uh, of that permanent chamber. Um, the internal rules of procedure have given body and substance to uh, the rules on allocation of cases uh, based on, on a number of principles which are not self-evident from the EPO regulation. Um, the, the permanent chambers uh, are tasked with following uh, uh, investigations and prosecutions and taking key decisions. Does that mean that there is a sort of, uh, how can we say it, uh, 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 prosecutorial equivalent of the principle of the natural judge? Uh, in that the permanent chambers have a, 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 a necessary link to an affair which is attributed to them based on uh, rules which are predetermined, uh, uh, foreseeable in terms of their application. Uh, it's not 
necessarily so, but what you will read in the internal rules of procedure is, first of all, <coughs> the preoccupation to ensure transparency in the, in the attribution of affairs to the permanent chambers uh, by a system of, of purely random allocation. Second, uh, uh, the fact that this once established, uh, this allocation has to be stable. Uh, which means that a permanent chamber should not be deprived of its supervision of a case unless there are very specific reasons to do so. And this, of course, has on the one hand uh, a underlying very pragmatic reason of, eff of, of efficiency, because once uh, three European mm -hmm. prosecutors have gotten to rights with the substance of an investigation, uh, it sh they shouldn't be forced to, to give it up and uh, for three of their colleagues in another permanent chamber to start from scratch. But there's also, of course, here a question of accountability in the sense of ensuring that uh, because of this need of transparency, uh, there should never be the impression that an affair is taken away from the supervision of a permanent chamber for purely uh, occasional or, or less noble motivations such as the disagreement with the orientation that the permanent chamber may have on the handling of a case and so on and so forth. Uh, the other piece of uh, legislation that, uh, of, of EU law that we are uh, trying to, 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 to uh, help uh, the, 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 the other organs of the EPO interpret is of course the BIF directive. And here I'm not going to dwell long, you've heard enough yesterday. Uh, one example that I would like to give of this activity concerns um, the type of uh, experience uh, you uh, get on the ground, uh, which is essential to actually evaluate concretely how this type of EU instrument works. Um, I'll give you one example uh, that we've had to address at quite le some length concerning a member state where um, the literal transposition of the PIF directive seemed to leave no room for doubt or reprimand to that member state in terms of compliance with their obligations. However, uh, the practice on the ground and the application of these rules by the courts showed uh, a sort of malicious compliance in that uh, uh, the letter of the law is systematically applied in such a way as to render the criminal law provisions on repression of certain types of fraud inapplicable. And uh, uh, reconstructing this and reconstructing the reasons why this is possible within the framework of the obligations uh, provided by the PIF directive uh, is uh, something that uh, was necessary to allow uh, the delegated prosecutor colleagues in that member states to try and address uh, possible remedies to that situation and that of course will ultimately feed into the dialogue which is ongoing between the EPO and the Commission in order to help the Commission do its job of, uh, of ensuring that uh, that's, uh, the obligations under EU law are respected. Um, there are other er less evident pieces of EU law which are relevant uh, to our work uh, that uh, again as, as legal service we uh, try to, 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 to uh, uh, introduce and 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 and, and supports uh, in terms of their interpretation. They're less evident and perhaps don't concern so much criminal law. But for instance, we have had to come to rights with the application of the computation of time uh, regulation, uh, old regulation of the European Communities, which establishes the rules applicable to uh, how you calculate uh, terms and deadlines when they are established uh, under EU law. Uh, so it may seem like a trivial matter, but take the provision on evocation with its punitive deadlines introduced by the legislator, uh, uh, which uh, needs to be uh, interpreted in terms of what it means for the EPO to, to be able to assess and uh, uh, exercise its uh, prerogatives under Article 27 of the regulation. The application of regulation, again, uh, something old, but, but, uh, but always uh, very important, regulation number one of 1958 on the use of languages. Now, what does it mean for the EPO to be a EU institution and therefore to be bound by regulation number 1958, which prescribes in dealings with member states and their authorities and citizens the use of the official language of that member state? What does it mean for an authority that inherently has uh, as its core business that of dealing with those authorities in terms of, of criminal procedures? What does it mean in terms of language of those procedures of production of the procedural acts of the EPO? So uh, just to give you a, a flavor of the type, uh, the, 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 the variety and the, the, the scope of the area of, of EU law uh, that, that uh, we uh, at uh, the level, central level of the EPO help to interpret, 
and we haven't even touched upon the national law. Uh, I hope uh, this, uh, this this staggering complexity of the system uh, uh, shines uh, through this very short description. Um, I close. We have, uh, uh, as I said, uh, provided some initial thinking. Uh, occasions like this are precious to have a first uh, test as to whether our initial thinking has any uh, reason uh, to, to, to hold up. And of course, uh, we are ready, we're braced for uh, the impact with uh, uh, what uh, the courts uh, of the member states and the Court of Justice will take with a final reflection. Um, I think one concept that uh, we as EPO will have to stress very strongly when we will start uh, dealing in a more structured manner with the courts is that when we do go before the courts of the member states, those courts uh, are, as the, uh, it's self-evident to those that, that uh, study EU law, but perhaps it's worth repeating it, those courts will be also at the same time national and European judges, because they will be called to apply European law. And uh, it will be our task to provoke what has been yesterday recalled as that reflex communautaire for these judges to apply this legal framework uh, 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 in a loyal manner and in such a manner to bring uh, to the table a virtuous dialogue between courts that will ultimately help clarify this complicated legal framework. I will stop here and, and uh, leave you to the fun part with, uh, with the people on the ground. So thank you very much, uh, Luca, for these preliminary words and, and very good introduction. Uh, just mapping some of the complexities. We will be um, the next years discussing and talking and, and having an eye on what is going on in the EPPO because for academics it's also a very, very fruitful research area. And um, obviously there are so many pending issues from the procedural point of view, but uh, I would like to underline one point that um, the EPPO will work well if you uh, really do a good work, but this is just an institution within a and a broader system. And if law enforcement in the relevant member states does not cooperate correctly, and the other way around, uh, rule of law and independence, judicial independence is one of the core elements just to make this institution also work efficiently. And um, I'm, I want to give the word right now to um, Danilo Ceccarelli who is right now the Deputy uh, Chief Prosecutor in the EPPO. So um, welcome, um, Mr. Ceccarelli or Danilo. And it's Danilo, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Danilo has been magistrate in Italy uh, since 1995 and has a, a wide career and experienced uh, work in um, fighting and prosecuting financial crime, tax fraud, corruption and organized crime and money laundering. So he has been also international prosecutor in Kosovo and um, international financial crime and corruption and international cooperation in the prosecution office in Milan. And I stop here reading and informing you about uh, the long and lengthy um, CV, which is impressive, of uh, Danilo in fighting um, economic crime, corruption, and obviously transnational um, crime. So please, Danilo, the word is yours. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Fondazione Basso, for inviting us. Um, I remember when we were first contacted by Fondazione Basso, it was a year and a half ago, and we had not even been appointed. It, it was like, right, I don't know yet what's, what's going to happen, if we will be appointed, when we will start working, uh, how we will start working. And, and what are we going to do at the beginning? Are we going to set up the office or start operations immediately? When are we going to open investigation number one? And now we know that that day is, uh, has happened. Uh, on, on 1st of June 2021, we opened case number one uh, of the PPO, which is a German case, just for your information. <laughs> uh, well, it's been, it's been a 
uh, it's been a tough period. It's, it's been it's been tough months here. Uh, I'm 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 going to talk now mainly about how I, as a supervising European prosecutor for Italy now, I will talk about the general picture, maybe uh, general problems later in the second tour. Uh, in Italy, uh, what, are, what, what are the difficulties? What have been the difficulties in setting up the office and what are the difficulties now? What are the main complex legal and organizational issues and uh, how we are trying to deal with it. We have today an ADP from the Office of Rome and is very well aware what I'm going to say now. Uh, I have to say Italy was not ready, really was not ready when we started working. We were appointed last September, September 2020, uh, and there were a few countries, really a few countries that were ready that had already started the selection procedure for the ADPs, that had identified the offices for the ADPs, that have identified competent courts. Okay, Italy was not the only member state <clears throat> that was delaying so much the preparation of the PPO. But there were a lot of other member states like that. But the complexity of the architecture of the Italian judiciary made everything so difficult and so complicated, and you can understand why. There was this process of approving the implementation law. It's not really an implementation law because the regulation applies automatically. It's a regulation. So, but all the member states needed some kind of legislation to adapt their own system to the regulation because the regulation having immediate and direct effect on the powers of the judiciary in the member state, of the powers of the prosecutor, of, of, on, on systematic provisions of the criminal procedural code that had to be adapted to the regulation, needed to uh, approve a legislation adopting the internal system to the regulation. This was, this was a long negotiation uh, and, and very complex. And, uh, and we have uh, decree number nine of 2021 that we all know. Uh, this is the Italian law about the EPPO. And uh, following that, I remember there, on, after, immediately after those times, the government fell. And there was a change in the Ministry of Justice. That, did, that didn't help speeding up the procedure, of course. But then with the new minister, Everything was res resumed very quickly. But it was already very late because we were about to start operations on the 1st of June. So in two months, three months, we had to select the ADPs, identify the physical offices, identify the support uh, staff for uh, the Italian offices of the ADP, entering the agreement with the EPPO about the number, the territorial distribution of the ADPs. You are certainly aware that uh, it was decided and it was agreed agreed to have in Italy a, a very fragmented organization of the Office of the ADPs. Nine different offices. This is, this is the only member state that, uh, that has such a fragmented organization. I really envy member states like France or Spain that have just one office for the ADP and one competent court. Everything is done in Paris or Madrid. How, how, how much easier is that? for us. And I also envy member states like Germany that when we started already had identified five centers for the ADPs and that already concentrated the competence of the court as much as, as much as possible, which means in the states, in the federal states, only 16 courts are competent for the PIF crimes. Here today we have 140 competent courts. We have to travel the country. The, the ADPs have to travel the country to go to court. But not only that. I mean, the situation is so difficult that even during the investigation, they have a judge, the preliminary investigation judge, scattered in 140 different small tribunals. That is making our life really tough. You can understand what, what that means every time you have to ask for an authorization for a freezing, for an investigation measure, for an interception. <clears throat> in an architecture where, for example, the interceptions are regulated by very specific laws 
with an archive of the data that is controlled and under the authority of the local chief prosecutor. They, they control and they have uh, possession of the archive of our data, of the data of the PPO. This is a consequence of the complexity of this architecture, but also of the hybrid nature of the peripheral office of the PPO. Even think about the status of the ADP that fully belong to the PPO. They are hired by us, nominated by us, paid by mm -hmm. us. But all the support staff, the administrative support staff, the, the police, the offices, all the material resources are given to us by the member states. So we depend on them. We really depend on them. Now, I have to say that in Italy I found a very cooperative approach. If we put apart the fact that it was <laughs> very much delayed than when we started cooperating, it was a very good cooperation. And you will see it, it's not like that in all the member states. We get to situations like Slovenia where we have open boycotting, refusing to give us the name of the Oedipus. <clears throat> and then we are paralyzed there. In Italy we work, we work well actually, we are working very well. Cases are <clears throat> flowing in, <clears throat> we are already very much operative pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's a pity we could not appoint uh, ADPs in five ADPs so far. It's just 15 out of 20, but hopefully the High Council will, <clears throat> will issue a new call. The High Council of the Judiciary. It's another element of complexity. Every time we have to go to the Ministry and to, to discuss issues, there was always the ghost of the High Council around the corner. Right? They, had, they have to be involved. That's, that's the the balance, the constitutional balance of the judiciary in Italy, even when it's about only prosecution, of course. Every agreement between the EPO and the national authority is an agreement with two national authorities, the ministry and high council. The territorial distribution of the EDP, their functions has to be, has been approved by the ministry and by the high council. Every time we talk to them, and we deal with them, we have to take in consideration two different authorities, at least. But then, a lot of burden have been put on the prosecutor's office that are hosting us, right? Because we, we work integrated, although we are totally independent, we are a totally different office, we, are, we cannot receive any kind of instruction, we cannot receive any kind of order. We cannot be coordinated by the National Anti-Mafia Directory, for example, which is the reason why we enter a working arrangement with them, a working agreement to cooperate and exchange information, if needs be, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Because you will see, we deal with cases that fall into the competence of the Anti-Mafia District Prosecutor's Office. It's, it's, they are pretty much involved in PIF offenses. We'll see a couple of specific cases. So, uh, but then the gist of our cooperation, our institutional uh, counterparts, most of the day of our operational life are on one side, police forces and prosecutor's offices, all the prosecutor's offices. 140 prosecutor's offices we have to deal with. And they are supposed, each of them is supposed to send to us information for possible evocation. We, we've been working very hard. I mean, like the ADPs have been traveling to different places to talk to colleagues, to, to, to educate them about the PPO, to tell them who we are, what are we, what we are doing, what, what is our role, and what is the, uh, the, the, the their role in, in, towards us. We counted, I mean, like at the central level of the EPO, we counted in the regulation 24 situations where there is a mandatory consultation, exchange of information between the central office of the EPO and the office of the ADPs and the National Prosecution Service. And this is what is mandatory because then there is a lot more Yesterday, someone talked about, well, 
we all talked about, conflict of competence or contrast of competence. Uh, and, and, and Lorenzo said something which is, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, more with that. If we want to avoid the conflict, we need to talk in advance. We need to communicate. We need to exchange ideas. We need to understand each other. And that, we are really doing that. I mean, I think the IDPs are most of the time on the phone with colleagues <laughs> to try and understand how to exchange information. What is in the case file? Is this my competence? Is this your competence? Can we split it? Can we work together? What can we do? And so far, we avoided any hint of possible conflict. It's only four months, okay? It's, we are really at the beginning, so we will see there will be conflicts in the future, without a doubt. But so far, uh, this has gone very well. This, this policy of talking, of communication, of having informal communication. And then the formal one, of course, when it's, when, when it's, when it's the right time to do that. So uh, this, this is a work that has been done for the last year and is still ongoing. I think it will never end, actually, because <laughs> on one side, setting up uh, such a complex institution like a European prosecutor's office with direct powers in the 22 member states, uh, well, that's, that's, that's a never-ending process. But the interaction with the local prosecutor's office, well, that, that will never end as well. It's in the regulation. It's, it's, every case has to be reassessed continuously by them and by us to see whether the competence shifts in their favor, in our favor. And so we have to exchange the communication and see if there is room for a referral, for the evocation on our side. So it's, it's a very long process that requires a lot of, a lot of liaising with and, and dealing with the counterparts. I mean, one of the things that when we were discussing the number of the ADPs in Italy, uh, how many, there were some criteria according to which there should have been over 30 ADPs in Italy. Uh, but according to our domestic criteria, where the prosecutors are very much charged with a lot of cases, there should have been <laughs> a lot fewer, right? So that was a compromise in the end, but uh, what was really not understood, and maybe now it's being understood, uh, is that uh, the work of the ADPs is, is very much different from the work of the usual domestic prosecutor. They have a ton of additional tasks. I mean, the way they, they have to work on, on also the, 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 the IT part of the whole of their job, okay? Everybody is using the, the domestic uh, case management system, GPR, GNR. Well, they have to use that and the EPO one, the EPO case management system that has totally different rules, a totally different architecture that require a lot of education, a lot of training, and at the same time in the domestic. And you know what? The supporting staff, the administrative staff, of course, they can access the domestic case, case management system. They cannot, they cannot access the EPO case management system because they are not staff of the PPO and the regulation forbids, prohibits the, the, the supporting staff even to touch a computer of the PPO, a European computer with the case management system. So the ADPs <laughs> work on the EPO case management system with the central staff of the EPO in Luxembourg. And how much time do you spend on the phone, Alberto, every day with them? <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really a different job. And then you have to undertake the investigation and go to court. And uh, we've, we've done it. We, we, we already have a lot of, of freezing and seizures and confiscation. And we have a very good record with that. We, are, we, we really want to recover assets that, that the EU is defrauded. And then there is the legal issue, because it's not only organizational, it's not only about the architecture and the structure, there are the legal issues. Uh, what, are, what are the main issues, at least in Italy, but I would say uh, in the other member states as, as well? The big, the big unknown, undiscussed, and, and almost uh, silent, uh, core offense of the EPPO that in the member states, at least in Italy, was totally underestimated. 
is smuggling and import VAT offenses. Okay, this, is, this is really something very, very sensitive. We have, we have and, and uh, to a great extent, it, it depends on the regulation. The regulation on Article 25, basically. 25, Paragraph 3, and Paragraph 4. The regulation is a, is a, is a, a structure where you set a rule, then you set an exception, then you set two sub-exceptions to the first exception, and there is also a possibility to make an exception to one of those sub-exceptions. That's how Article 25 works. Just read it, one, one paragraph after the other, you get, you get mad reading that, right? So what we have there? We have a rule that we can exercise the competence for PIF offenses if it's, let's say, above 10,000 euros damaged, then if it's done, there is an interlinked offense, we can exercise the competence if the other offense is instrumental to the PIF offense. Otherwise, we can exercise the offense only if the PIF offense is more serious than the non-PIF offense. Careful, more serious, because if the maximum penalty is the same, the case goes to the national authority. But in Italy, we have a system where in order to understand if a penalty is more serious, we consider the maximum and the minimum. The regulation doesn't say anything about that. It's only the maximum, right? So there we have smuggling, excises, which is a different offense when it comes to petrol and alcohol. So we have to, it's the same action, but it's two different offices. So we have to understand which one is more serious. And then we have the import VAT offense, which is the very old and bizarre, the way it's written, Article 70 of Decree 633 of 1973, it's almost 50 years that this article is there, completely ignored <laughs> by most of the colleagues, right? Because never been applied. Now for us, it's becoming a big thing. And, uh, and uh, the legislation on the, on the PIF, PIF directed completely forgot this crime, completely forgot that this offense exists and if it involves two member states and it's above 10 million, it's a PIF offense. We have fraudulent schemes with the abuse of custom procedure 42, which from Olaf, you know very well. And these are massive frauds. We have frauds with damage of 20, 30, 50 million VAT uh, evaded. Very common, usually from, from Eastern Asia. Uh, they smuggle, smuggle. Actually, it, it's not even smuggled. It's centered with this custom procedure, with the provisional import, and then the goods vanish, and nobody pays the VAT. They are distributed in different member states. And everything, everything. The VAT is lost. It's a big loss for the member states. You know, VAT is only for a most small percentage, a resource of the EU. But that's the member states that lose a lot of money there, and nobody is really fighting that. And now for us, this becomes a priority. And in Italy, we have a big problem because that offense, and as regards sanctions, makes reference to the, to the law on smuggling. It doesn't say anything about the import VAT in itself. So we have like an asymmetric situation where we have uh, these different offenses and we have to see which one is the most serious. And in Italy, fortunately, the smuggling offense in the aggravated case, which is always the case for us, uh, is the most serious. We can exercise the competence there. But then you have tobacco smuggling. Tobacco smuggling, there is no special provision, provision for the excise. And so you have the custom fee and the excise in the same criminal provision. And there it's 23 paragraph 25, paragraph 3, letter B that applies, which means that you have to go and see who... Uh, where the, 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 the most serious damage uh, was done, which is the victim that, uh, that, uh, that had the most serious damage. So it's a totally different criteria because it doesn't matter if you have an offense with a very low punishment. If the damage is higher, so the case goes to the national authority or to the European authority, to the EPPO. So it's, it's a very different criteria, right? And, and for tobacco smuggling, we have that case that situation. So can we exercise the competence for tobacco smuggling? 
Yes, but we, if we apply the exception of the sub-exception, which is paragraph four, with the consent of the national authority, right? That's what we can do, and that's what we are doing, because colleagues understand that we are in a better position to, to, to investigate here. It's, it's, it's happening now. We, we never have so far a denial, uh, always had an agreement to take over the, the, the case. But who is the national authority in a position to give us the agreement? Is it the local prosecutors that is already dealing with the case or that seized the tobacco? No, it's the general prosecutor office at the Court of Cassation. So every time we have to take, ask them to give us the consent to take over the case, wait for the decision, and then we can exercise the competence. So this is like so complex and somehow so bureaucratic. And, and these two crimes were so forgotten that uh, there is a quite blatant violation of the Fifth Directive for smuggling because the legislature, the Italian legislature, forgot to foresee the value confiscation for smuggling. We don't have that. Although it's, it's mandatory in the Fifth Directive, because the Fifth Directive makes reference to the Directive on the Mutual Recognition of Freezing and Confiscation that makes that kind of confiscation mandatory. And we have, it, it's a paradox, we have for smuggling, we can, we can apply the extended confiscation, which, which is a punishment much more serious than the value confiscation, but we cannot apply the value confiscation. And the same goes for import VAT. And for import VAT, we don't even have a special provision for cases where the damage is above 10 million, which is mandatory. Again, we need a punishment above four years and a lot of other requirements that are in the PIF directive. So we are fighting with this. We are fighting with all these problems every day. And, and, and this requires us to go to the commission, to the Ministry of Justice, to, to, to inform them about this problem and this other problem, this organizational problem, this legal problem. It's a very different job from the from what we used to do until a few months ago. It, it's, it's, it requires a different set of skills. It's not the traditional prosecutor or the traditional chief prosecutor or deputy that coordinates and, and uh, uh, overlook the investigation. It's, it's very decent for, for this reason. And then also for, for the fact that there is all the work that we have to do at the central office, that I have to do at the central office, as a supervising EP, but also as a component of the permanent chamber and, uh, and uh, as, as someone who is involved in handling the case management system and the management of the office. So that's, that's a quite complex architecture. Now, my colleagues will talk to you also about this, but, uh, but I mean, this is just to give you a gist of the, of the set of problems that we are facing now. I, I would leave the floor to my colleagues to talk about their own experience before we go back for a second round. Thank you very much, Danilo. <laughs> Thank you for uh, familiarizing us with the real work you're, you're doing and, and facing every day. So uh, we wish you only a lot of energy because uh, <laughs> you will need it, of course. Uh, we will leave the discussion for later. I go directly to uh, giving the floor to the next speaker. Um, who, according to my list, is uh, Ms. Ingrid marshall Clausen. So she has worked as deputy to the head of the Austrian Public Prosecutor's Office in fighting corruption and economic crime from 2015 until 2020. So she has also broad experience in this field. And um, she was appointed um, before the European Prosecutor um, for Austria. So... Um, she, she has been working already in, for Eurojust and um, serving also as justice counselor and head of the justice section of the permanent representation to the European Union. So broad experience in transnational crime, economic crime and European law. So please, Ingrid, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorena. I've brought some slides, yes, and I've been told that there should be a remote control somewhere here on our desk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, actually, I've prepared quite a number of slides, but uh, we will not go, don't worry, we will not go uh, in detail into each of them. And 
I think the first the, the, the first test will be the sort of intelligence test to see whether I will figure out how it's working. Ah, okay. All right. Um, indeed, uh, may I start by adding my voice to uh, the previous speakers who have already thanked uh, Fondazione Basso for organizing this conference. And I'm uh, very, very grateful that we can have this conference in, in presence and not remotely, as unfortunately we um, had to um, work during the last year and a half with a lot of remote meetings. So I'm very, very grateful to have actually real people sitting around me. It does make a difference, I find. Now, um, the, the title of uh, this session is EPO, How Is It Working? And uh, actually, we, the, the three prosecutors here, Danilo, Thomas and I, we decided that uh, we, we would like to shed light uh, together with you on the three roles, three different roles that, that we are performing within the EPO. First of all, a supervising European prosecutor. Now you've heard already Danilo about uh, his role within the Italian system, then obviously we have a role to play as permanent members in the permanent chambers, second role. So that would be our second round. And the third role that we are performing is being member of the college of the EPPO. Um, that we will talk about, I think, or at least I will talk a bit about it uh, in the third round. Now, having been myself uh, a former national member at Eurojust, where you also have this collegial structure, this college structure, I am already used to uh, working also within such a setup. And it is true, Danilo, this is a, a completely different setting and requires completely different tasks from uh, a, a, a prosecutor's regular work. Now, um, how is the EPO working? So we, you will know that uh, we started on the 1st of June and uh, we started, uh, and now it's not working, hooray. Why is it not working? Please help. Yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, you all know that uh, we, we started on the 1st of June and uh, we have a bit more than 120 days uh, of operation behind us. So obviously it's, it's way too early to draw uh, real conclusions, but uh, at least we can say that the start was a good one. Uh, statistics actually, Laura uh, mentioned them. So far we, we have registered approximately 2,000 cases since the 1st of June, 2,000 cases. Out of these 2,000, approximately 2,000 cases, some uh, uh, 1,200 were submitted by public authorities. Um, out of these uh, 2,000 registered cases, we have taken over, evoked, or initiated uh, some 350 investigations. They are uh, running. And uh, the criminal offenses, which uh, which are covered by these investigations, involve an estimated damage to the EU budget of approximately 4.5 billion euro. And this is the first result of 120 days of operation. That's quite impressive, I would say. So, first experiences in terms of the quality of our work. That was the quantity quality of, of our work. I must say that um, I found it personally surprising how well we managed to start off. Uh, we have already proven that we can properly work as a single office and that we have added value there. We have already in the cases that we are currently dealing with, with and uh, actually one of them was also an Austrian case, discovered that there were parallel investigations ongoing uh, in, in different member states by prosecutors' offices there, 
one not knowing that the other one was investigating the same criminal offense, the same facts. So there we do have added value. Uh, Cross-border operations, Laura has mentioned them. Actually, we, we can be fairly quickly in uh, organizing um, and executing uh, organized measures at the same time, house searches at the same time. Also, we had already successful uh, cooperation cases with non-participating member states, particularly Hungary. I, I don't know, Danilo, whether you will talk a bit about the external dimension. Yeah, I'll yeah, I, I, I leave it at that. So, um, Dan, yes. Um, in the almost a year between uh, our taking up, up uh, office, which uh, took place in September, September last year, and the 1st of June, we had to prepare actually for the start of operations. And uh, you have to imagine that Actually, we are a unique thing, obviously, and there is no precedent. So um, what we were preparing uh, was based on assumptions. Luca has mentioned the internal rules of procedure. Luca has mentioned, I think, also the conditions of employment for our uh, delegated European prosecutors. And what we have prepared was based on assumptions. It's like... Um, trying to learn to swim in a swimming pool where you don't have water. You, you, think, you think you're doing the right thing, you think you're doing the right movements, but only when you actually put the water into the swimming pool, you will understand whether actually you have really trained the right way or whether you don't manage to sink. Now, we have, on the 1st of June, actually, the water went into the swimming pool. And we have seen that actually um, out of the um, um, 140 uh, European delegated prosecutors uh, that we should have in this first stage, uh, we have appointed 91, and the 91 which we have mm -hmm. are very good ones. Um, they are qualified, they are flexible, and they are able to adjust this to, to this completely new working environment. Uh, we have, by the way, the college has also, uh, in, in a few cases, refused to appoint uh, persons nominated by member states, uh, because actually we thought, as a college, they would not fulfill the requirements set out in the regulation. Um, we have in the college agreed that we would start up, uh, that we would start with a setup of 15 permanent chambers. We just had to start somewhere and actually the, the legal ser service was very, very, very helpful in developing different models. We were discussing whether we should have specialized, specialized chambers, VAT fraud chambers, for instance. But we decided that we would start um, with no specialization um, and with uh, 15 permanent chambers uh, who would deal with all cases. We have random allocation of cases to these 15 permanent chambers. Now, there is obviously uh, not, there will not be an even distribu distribution of the workload of own cases as supervising prosecutor. Now, Danilo will have at some point 20, I believe, European delegated prosecutors. I have two. Um, Austria will have much less cases to deal with than Italy, for instance. So how can we assure an even workload between uh, the European prosecutors? So we decided, and so far I think um, the, the concept is a good one and, and the decision was a good one. Um, we have decided that actually the European prosecutors, which presumably, who presumably will have many cases to supervise, will be a member of only one permanent chamber, whilst the ones who presumably will have to deal with less cases, such as me, 
uh, are members of three permanent chambers. That is how we started off. But that will also be actually one of the issues and one of the challenges we will have to deal with as, as, uh, as an office. Um, we have also, that is uh, also very um, important for our practical work, agreed on an investigation policy and guidelines on evocation, non-evocation of cases and case referrals, and we'll come to these later. Um, yes, some things, however, we're just discovering need to be adjusted. Uh, the internal rules of procedure need adjustments here and there, which we discover now that we have started off, now that we're really dealing with practical cases. There have already been revisions of the internal rules of procedure that will need to be more. The case management system needs to be improved. We have so many legal questions which we have to answer in our daily work. Luca has uh, made reference to some of them. We had the import VAT question already yesterday. We'll go to some more questions in the second round. We have missing EDPs. Slovenia was mentioned. And we need more personnel at the central level. We will need financial analysts. We will need a lot of legal support personnel, particularly for the European prosecutors who will have to supervise many cases. Um, there are some budgetary issues. It's work in progress and continuous learning. Now, coming to Austria, the Austrian setup, my role as supervising European prosecutor. As mentioned, I have two EDPs. Both of them have a uh, long experience uh, in dealing with corruption cases um, and economic crime cases. The three of us, we come from the same uh, PPO, the central office um, to combat uh, corruption and economic crime. Um, despite the fact that I have only two persons, we have this strange construction that one sits in Vienna and one sits in Graz. Um, but they both come from the same PPO and they both have stayed in their offices embedded in this uh, prosecutor's office which has um, a headquarter in Vienna and branch offices in some Austrian cities. And one of these cities is Graz. Now, that complicates our life a little bit because actually I cannot, uh, we cannot meet in Vienna. So we have uh, to discuss a lot uh, um, virtually, remotely, but it works. Um, we have... Uh, they have uh, two administrative assistants. Actually, we have organized ourselves in such a way that we have two persons working 50% each in Graz and two persons, administrative assistants, working 50% each in Vienna. They uh, can make use of uh, the IT experts, which uh, the Austrian prosecutors' offices, and particularly the office where they are embedded in where we come from, can use. And um, there are also economic experts, in-house experts, which they can use, particularly tax experts. That's very, very helpful. Um, yeah, the investigations will effectively be conducted by our police, by our customs authorities, by our tax authorities, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, now, obviously, as we are a small country, um, our setup is not as complicated as the Italian one, and um, the obligation for the national authorities, particularly for the prosecutor's office and the head of the prosecutor's office, where both my EDPs are embedded in, um, stems directly from the regulation and is repeated in the Austrian implementing legislation. We, we don't need any additional agreements, arrangements. Discussions are very informal, email, phone. So from that point of view, it's good. Also, the cooperation with the team in, in actually the setup of a team is very good. 
but there are so many legal issues which we have to resolve and so many um, legal questions to which we don't have a straightforward answer. Um, as for cases, <coughs> almost all the Austrian cases which uh, were already pending before the 1st of June uh, at uh, any Austrian prosecutor's office were submitted to the EPPO. So that obligation has been complied with. We have already found out that there was, in one case, a, a dual investigation ongoing in Germany and in Austria for the same case, and um, both countries and both prosecutors' offices weren't aware of that. What we still need to do is we have to promote ourselves and have to get ourselves known towards the police, towards the customs authorities, uh, towards the tax authorities. And uh, why is that so? Because actually uh, the Austrian law to implement the EPPO entered into force uh, on the 30th of May 2021. So there was no time beforehand to prepare there was no time to uh, 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 prepare also the investigating, then effectively investigating authority that we would be about to start. So this is something still on the to-do list for us. By the way, um, in Austria, all public authorities, it can be the mayor of a little village, have the obligation to report uh, cases potentially coming under the competence of the EPO to the EPO. Many cases will, or many reports will obviously end up at a regular, normal Austrian prosecutor's office because that will not be known to everyone. So these, the, our prosecutor's offices at home will be mainly the, 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 the partners we have to talk to and work with. Um, Oh, I should probably also say about cases that um, just last week we had a successful, the fir first successful cooperation, operative cooperation with um, an Austrian prosecutor's office um, in a case which is uh, dealt with by the EPO uh, about, um, uh, about uh, FFP2 masks. Uh, actually, in Austria, uh, an investigation, and I can talk about it because the case has been in the media. In Austria, an investigation is ongoing because of fraud. These lovely, or similar lovely um, FFP2 masks having been produced in China, but having been sold in Austria as produced in Austria, good Austrian quality for an Austrian price. And actually, it turned out that everything, or almost everything, was produced in China and a uh, well, regular fraud case. Uh, there have been several rounds of house searches in the fraud case. Now, obviously, along with the fraud comes the fact that these masks have not been declared properly when imported into the EU, but could not have been, of course, otherwise they would have admitted that they were produced in China. So we have evasion of, of customs duties. Here the EPO comes in. And just last week, we had... Uh, Another round of house searches performed, carried out jointly in Austria. Um, uh, together, the Austrian PPO and uh, one of my EDPs as assisting EDP, and that worked really well. Potential is issues and hopes for the future concerning my system. Well, um, concerning our investigation authorities, we don't have any police judiciaire but the police reports to the Minister of the Interior as hierarchical superior. Question is, are there tensions, and I would assume yes, with the principle of the independence, independence of the EPO from the national authorities? Um, we don't have any centralization of the court competencies, also scattered, la scattered landscape that will um, be complex. Um, workload for the EDPs, uh, the two EDPs, um, the number of the two EDPs have been agreed on the basis of estimates of cases. Not included in this uh, estimate of cases are the cases 
when they will act uh, as assisting EDPs. So we will see how much workload this will create. And uh, I have a personal wish, and I take the opportunity to express this here at this conference. I hope that the EPPO can serve as a role model for the prosecutor's offices in Austria because they are not independent from the government. They are not independent from political, from political parties, yes, but the Minister of Justice is the, uh, the, uh, the ultimate superior of the prosecutor's offices in Austria. We don't have a prosecutor general in Austria. Um, we have a very hierarchical system with a lot of reporting obligations and the right for the Minister of Justice to give instructions in individual cases. And I hope that actually with the EPO now, um, having seen uh, daylight, this can serve as a role model and will boost the uh, uh, ongoing discussions in Austria on how to disconnect the uh, um, prosecutor's offices from the government. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Ingrid, for these insights. Um, I have a good um, um, information for you. We have decided to do the coffee break right now and then listen to the next two speakers because these people promise to talk not more than 10 minutes, but uh, as they are very independent and they are supranational structure, uh, they didn't abide by any hierarchical rules. So uh, we make a 20 minute coffee break if everyone agrees. Thank you very much.
So welcome back again to everyone. And um, we resumed the very interesting uh, presentations on how the EPPO is working. And um, now we have the pleasure to introduce, I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Uh, Thomas Krusner. And uh, Thomas Krusner is the former chief prosecutor of criminal prosecution department in the general office in Lithuania. And prior to this, um, he has been working for the European Commission and in the OLAF. So um, he has also been working at Eurojust, and uh, he has been a prosecutor since 1998. So it's another very professional piece, I would say, public prosecutor, high-level public prosecutor, um, in the EPPO. So we are very pleased to have you here. Uh, Thomas, the word is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Lorena. And I also would like to thank organizers for the possibility to join this meeting and uh, uh, Fundacion Basso for following this uh, project in the different stages. I believe it uh, co contributes to the further growth of the organization. My colleagues already uh, touched upon uh, different aspects uh, in relation to the functions of the European prosecutor. And uh, uh, primary, we, we, we can uh, see those functions uh, both as strategic and uh, operational functions. And those includes uh, functions as a member of the college, as a supervising uh, PP. One interesting aspect is uh, substituting European prosecutor and European prosecutor as a member of a permanent chamber. We also may speak about the uh, specificities of the status of the European prosecutor under applicable national law, which is uh, a case in certain member states. And uh, what are the specifics uh, is the role of the European prosecutor during the setup phase of the European Public Prosecutor's Office, and uh, what is important during this stage, uh, the role of the European prosecutor in relation to the decentralized level and uh, the national authorities. The first meeting of the College of uh, EPPO, so the meeting of European prosecutors took uh, in the beginning of September last year. And at that time, um, the EPPO had a limited internal legislation, interim premises, uh, I would say limited uh, infrastructure, uh, only the first uh, EPPO staff members and no European delegated prosecutors. So at that time, the system of working group uh, composed of European prosecutors uh, and EPPO was, staff was established uh, with uh, dedicated different uh, tasks. And uh, this resulted, I would say, in a number of the decisions uh, by the college. So uh, in a less uh, than one year, the prosecution service started to operate. And uh, it looks like a uh, really short period of time, but most probably after a couple of years, we realized what progress was uh, achieved. Uh, I would like just to um, add a uh, uh, couple of comments in relation to, let's say, um, setup uh, of uh, the decentralized office in my country and uh, Lithuania. And uh, again, so this is just to illustrate uh, the, how, how the creation of a single office of EPO was, was done. So uh, for the moment, uh, we have uh, four European delegated prosecutors. So they were appointed in the middle of March, which was good because we had uh, relatively a long time to be prepared for the start of operation, to be familiar with a different legal framework, with uh, new IT tools, and uh, finish their home cases. Uh, one prosecutor still continues to act as a national prosecutor, 
which is uh, another, another issue which does not allow him 100% uh, work on the EPPO cases. But all in all, uh, we had a successful start. And uh, this successful start resulted that we dealt with the backlog cases in two weeks. Uh, the precondition for this, uh, I would say, was, uh, let's say, a couple of aspects. The firstly, that uh, National Prosecution Service was proactively involved uh, in the legislative procedure as far as related to amendments uh, with respect to a PPO regulation. And uh, really, uh, huge work was done uh, when making uh, changes in the internal uh, regulations of the National Prosecution Service. Uh, we uh, reached uh, results uh, when uh, making amendments in the national CMS. We, we have uh, pretty much advanced uh, case management system, which is integrated with all law enforcement institutions, as well with the courts. And uh, now the next step would be just to try to find a way to have uh, interoperability with the uh, EPPO CMS. Uh, when uh, I mentioned uh, one aspect uh, related to the uh, status of the European prosecutor, so just maybe practically we, when we speak about uh, uh, the in agenda of the individual European prosecutor, it depends on number of cases uh, dealt by the uh, decentralized office in the respective member states. Uh, the number of cases uh, at uh, the permanent chamber in which uh, European prosecutor participates and uh, what is different is uh, specificities of the applicable national law. And uh, this element involves uh, several dimensions. The first thing uh, that uh, we have really different uh, procedures where for the European prosecutor the different uh, procedural role is uh, established. As example, I can give uh, the Lithuanian criminal procedure code where European prosecutor acts as a superior uh, prosecutor. It means that uh, it's, it is additional uh, supervision layer with uh, additional tasks in relation to the legality check of the decisions of an uh, individual European delegated prosecutor considering uh, the complaints uh, from the parties to the procedure up to the end of the pretrial investigation, and uh, even uh, some organizational measures, such as extension of terms of the uh, pretrial investigation. In, in this way, I would say it somehow to correlates to the function of the chambers in relation to the uh, mo monitoring. Uh, what, what helped a lot uh, before the start of operations uh, is uh, the continuous dialogue uh, with the national authorities. Maybe it's not st uh, strictly written in the regulation, but uh, we did a lot when meeting with the national prosecutors, with various ministries. Uh, EU bodies, uh, not sorry, not EU bodies, national authorities responsible for the administering of the EU funds. And in a way, it was uh, marketing uh, of uh, EPPO. Uh, technically, all have to know uh, competencies of EPPO and have to know that the cases have to be reported to EPPO. When it goes to the practical realization, it means that uh, all uh, prosecutors, judges, uh, administering uh, institutions of uh, EU funds uh, have to know what is exactly uh, EPPO competence, which is the way to report, which is the form to report. And uh, as a result of numerous meetings with the uh, territorial offices, uh, with the uh, pretrial investigation institutions, uh, we reached the result and uh, they know to whom to address the specific countries, and uh, we made, uh, I would say, even additional uh, step because uh, the priorities uh, uh, related uh, to the competence of the EPPO were established at national level. Re recently, a couple of weeks ago, we had the national 
anti-fraud strategy where the elements uh, related to the EPPO competence are included and uh, in this regard so the national law enforcement uh, is under obligation, let's say, to, to work uh, proactively in detection and investigation of those cases. And another aspect is uh, that uh, those elements as well were involved in, in uh, relevant plans uh, of uh, na uh, at national level concerning to the uh, money laundering uh, programs, where as well we got a piece of uh, Mm, uh, uh, European Pro uh, Prosecutor's Office involvement. On, all in all, uh, um, cert that uh, f now the office uh, consisting of uh, three prosecutors, one uh, delegated prosecutor is to come, is functioning well. So we have uh, da daily uh, dialogue uh, on individual cases. And uh, I would say I, I was really positively surprised that the workload is increasing. We have incoming new cases and when compared to the average uh, cases handled by, by the prosecutor uh, at the prosecutor general's office, so we, we, we reached this uh, level in uh, around four months, which in a way is uh, May, may look at challenge and as soon as we start uh, working with the uh, proceedings at the courts. So, as uh, um, Madame Chair uh, proposed to check the independence um, of the uh, European prosecutor, so I, 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 I see that uh, I, I, I had 10 minutes uh, and 45 seconds, and uh, it's, it's, I believe it shows uh, both, uh, let's say, attempt for the independence and proof of real independence, but as soon as the request was received from academia, I do not treat it as an attempt. Thank you. Thank you, dear Thomas. Someone told me that you have a very British sense of humor, so, <laughs> and I realized it right now. Um, and thank you for your <coughs> generosity, because uh, the time you are safe is provided for the next speaker. It's not that uh, he will have more time, but um, he will have his right time. I have the pleasure, I have the pleasure to introduce right now um, Nicholas Franson. And uh, most of you already know uh, Nicolas, and he has been counselor and international coordinator at the Ministry of Justice and Security in the Netherlands, and has wide experience in uh, all issues of uh, European um, Union uh, criminal laws, and specifically with regard to OLAF and uh, all the EPPO matters, because he was uh, directly involved in the negotiations about the PPO and OLAF regulations. So uh, he has also chaired the um, um, GAF, the group anti-fraud in COPEN. So he's a widely expert in these topics. And we are really very much expecting to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Lorena. Good morning, everyone. Um, you're, you're setting the standard, you're, you're raising the expectations to a very high level, but I'll try and uh, comply, uh, knowing that it is a challenge to be the last speaker before lunch, of course, um, even though uh, the number of courses last night will probably postpone the moment, moment where you will actually um, sense um, a feeling of imminent starvation, uh, but that was my <laughs> personal experience anyway. Um, first things first, um, I'm very, very, very pleased to be back at Fondazione Basso. It's actually the third time uh, that I'm here for a conference on the EPPO. Um, even though um, when asked to take part in this particular panel, I, I initially wondered why me? You know, um, all of the people here, except you, of course, Madam Chair, actually work for the EPPO, whereas I do not. Um, all I, I know about its operational work is primarily based on the EPPO's Twitter account, which I follow intensely, and uh, where I, 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 I noticed that the Guardia di Finanza, as you would expect, is doing an excellent job in line with their perfect reputation. 
Um, on top of that, you know, it seems early days, as Ingrid yeah. said, to draw any conclusions. Mm -hmm. The EPPO has only been operational for about four months. So yes, there are still 49 delegated prosecutors missing and uh, 350 investigations ongoing at the value of 4.6. Actually, I, I think it is billion, but to my knowledge, uh, it would be impossible anyway. Um, there hasn't been a conviction, let alone a final conviction or a single euro uh, recovered. It's too soon. Then again, you know, uh, I would have probably been prepared to give a presentation about any subject being able to come to Rome um, after the pandemic. Uh, so um, I'm happy to be here. But anyway, all joking apart, uh, I, I, I'm going to try and contribute to the debate uh, about a serious subject. Um, and I will do so by exploring um, uh, something, a, a slightly different perspective to the EPPO's functioning. Um, and the angle for that discussion will be uh, independence and accountability, not or accountability. Um, I have to say this because I work for the ministry. I will express my personal views. That doesn't make them irrelevant. <laughs> but um, uh, don't call my ministry if you disagree. Um, let me set the scene a little first before I start. The, the point of departure, I think, is that no public prosecution service, and the EPPO neither, could expect or would want to function without a degree of accountability and some degree of democratic legitimacy. To be very precise, all that I'm going to say does not concern the treatment of individual cases or judicial control over them. That's a form of accountability, but that's not the issue I will go into today. Uh, I'm, I'm, you may refer to them as policy or administrative matters or budgetary matters or whatever. So I will not be speaking about the EPPO's individual investigation. Um, now, um, there's a kind of Bible on the prosecution service. It was drawn up by the Venice Commission in 2011. Um, and it's called European Standards as regards the independence of the judicial system. Uh, much to my um, joy, in fact, <laughs> there is a paragraph, paragraph B, on public accountability of the prosecutor's office. So I haven't invented the concept. That's basically the point I'm trying to make. Um, looking at 40.41, it says, like any state authority, including judges, the prosecutor's office needs to be accountable to the public. And it is important to clear, point 43, what aspects of the prosecutor's work do, do or do not require to be carried out independently? The crucial element, this point claims, seems to be that the decision whether to prosecute or not should be for the prosecution service alone and not for the executive or the legis legislature, which confirms what I said, keep off individual investigations and prosecutions. I think we all agree on that. So what does the regulation actually say about independence? You'll find this in Article 6. The EPPO shall be independent. That is the main principle, which means that it shall act in the interest of the union as a whole, as defined by law, and neither seek or take instructions from any person external to the EPPO, any member state, institution, body, office, agency, nobody. Whether this independence was intended to apply to the cases only, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it was ever made explicit, but that's the interpretation I give to it now. Um, the independence is to be combined with a degree of accountability, according to the regulation. You'll find this in Article 6, Paragraph 2 and 7. The accountability is given form through the obligation on the EPPO to send an annual report on its general activities to the Council, the European Parliament, the Commission, evidently, I should mention the Commission first, probably, and national parliaments. The national parliaments were not in the original proposal of the Commission, but were added at the request of the Netherlands, among others, and France and Poland, interestingly. Um, so the EPPO will send this, no doubt, thinking of the reports that Olaf produces very glossy publication to these institutions, and the chief will then make her appearance to discuss the main findings. 
She may also be invited to, uh, to come to hearings at the national parliament, but for some reason which I cannot recall, um, the regulation allows her to send her deputies. <laughs> that probably says something about the way um, the negotiators appreciated the relationship between the EPPO and national parliaments. Okay, it's better than nothing, I suppose. In the third place, there is a provision on the dismissal, the potential dismissal of the European chief and a similar one on the dismissal of European prosecu prosecutors. You'll find this in articles 14 and 16. The criterion for that is serious misconduct. Just exactly what that actually means remains to be seen. Uh, rumor has it that the, uh, the college is uh, reflecting on disciplinary rules for the members of the college. So we're looking forward to see them and, and uh, have some sort of tangible criteria to um, assess whether such a situation could ever arise. Um, evidently, that's the point I'm going to try and make, the EPPO does not operate in a vacuum. So I would like to describe the various actors um, that also operates in that environment and with which the EPPO will have to deal to some extent. Uh, first and foremost, that would be the European Commission, of course, to which the EPPO is accountable under Article 6. I think, judging by the past, the experience in the past two years or so, we, we can safely conclude that the Commission is by far the most important partner uh, to the EPPO. And by means of illustration, just look at the working arrangement between the EPPO and the Commission. It comprises no less than 50 pages. Uh, so much, in fact, that I haven't ventured out to read all of it because it's very technical. But it says something about the importance of the relationship. There are many administrative links between the EPPO and the Commission, particularly in the budgetary, financial area, human resources, personnel, and even uh, IT. Um, According to the regulation, the Commission has various roles which are relevant to the existence of the EPO, ranging from anything to the, the appointment procedure for the European Chief Prosecutor, uh, the drawing up a delegate and relegation concerning operational data that the EPPO can, uh, can uh, treat with or deal with. Um, it would obviously have to, to draw up a mandate for negotiations with third countries on cooperation agreements, uh, an advocacy decision possibly. So the Commission indirectly has a big role in promoting the efficiency of the EPPO. Let me put it like that. And yet, you've probably seen the article in the EU's Observer of the 17th of September. Um, the Commission has blocked an amount of money around 7 million that the EPPO had hoped to spend um, but will not be able to and has therefore returned to the Commission. The second actor I would like to mention obviously is the European Parliament. Um, again, the EPPO is accountable to the European Parliament according, uh, under Article 6. The European Parliament, Parliament has had a very prominent role in the appointment of Ms. Kervishi, who is their darling. I think it's safe to say there's, there's a kind of romance between the European Parliament and the, and the, and the current Chief Prosecutor. The European Parliament does monitor developments, um, uh, particularly regarding the appointment procedures in, in some member states, even though I had the feeling that part of that was a national discussion being fought in the European Parliament rather than uh, a major uh, attack on the Commission. Um, and of course, uh, the European Parliament has um, raised the budgetary issue as well. In fact, just last week on Friday in the Cont Committee, and I'd say the general mood was hallelujah. I mean, I don't think the EPPO will, will expect much, will have, will have much to fear from the European Parliament so far. They, 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 they love the EPPO, basically. Then there's the Council. Um, again, the EPPO being accountable to the Council under Article 6. Um, what in fact happens yesterday even, and this is why Mrs. Kovashi was online uh, at the conference and not here, um, she would present a state of play, a progress report, and probably say that uh, there are still 49 EDPs mission, missing in action or something along those lines. But there's no real political debate or 
um, criticism from the part of the Council on certain aspects of the functioning of the EPPO, so far anyway. Um, at the lower level, the one at which I operate, among others, um, the, the most recent encounter between the EPPO and, and representatives of member states was in a working group called COPAN, which was on the 16th of April, where we discussed, among others, uh, a note on the expenses incurred by delegated prosecutors. Since then, there have been no more encounters uh, of that type, um, despite a specific request from the Portuguese presidency to, to, to find an opportunity to discuss the recently adopted operational guidelines on investigations, evocation policy, and referral of cases. That was simply rejected by the um, EPPO. Um, there may be a meeting later this uh, autumn uh, to discuss uh, a recent letter from the college about rules on disciplinary procedures, the one that I just referred to, possibly um, the EPPO's relations with third countries, but we will see um, whether that will actually happen. Now, there are two more uh, actors which may be less controversial, I guess. The European Court of Auditors obviously has a role in the discharge procedure, uh, it also has a working arrangement with the EPPO dated the 3rd of September this year, and there's the EDPS. Um, that has several tasks under ch Chapter 8 of the regulation, um, whose tasks are referred to in Recital 98, if you're interested. The main question, of course, at that point is what will the EDPS's role actually mean in practice? Just looking at the experiences that Europol has, this could be potentially very significant role in the sense that, I don't know if you know about the situation, um, the, the EDPS has um, taken the opinion that Europe has no legal basis to uh, process huge volumes of data, which is essentially what Europol is about. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that the EDPS will effectively block the work of the EPPO, but, but it will be interesting to see, it's too soon, what effect it will have on your operations. Uh, there may be a tension uh, between the, um, um, the conditions under which criminal procedures take place and data protection requirements, as much as we, ha as we have tried to separate the two in the regulation, of course. Then there's, there are friends from OLAF, uh, a very important part uh, with a complementary role, as the mantra goes. Um, the Commission had forgotten about them, but then under the Dutch presidency, we introduced a provision on cooperation between OLAF and the EPPO and the EPPO regulation, Article 101. The OLAF regulation itself has been revised since to, to, to enable um, this cooperation. And obviously, OLAF also has a working arrangement with the EPPO dated the 5th of July. Even more interesting is a recent college decision of the 30th of June, which concerns the accession of the EPPO to a very old inst institutional agreement of the 25th of May, 1999, and that concerns investigations by OLAF. In other words, if ever there was a uh, reason to think that there uh, were irregularities or even mismanagement within the EPPO, the OLAF could step in. Now, suppose that OLAF were to find that something had gone wrong, that there was uh, something, a reason to, to start a criminal investigation. An interesting question, of course, would be, who would then do it? Would the EPPO do so itself, or would it leave it to the national authorities? Uh, in Luxembourg, I suppose. Um, um, we'll see. I, mean, I, I don't know, it's very theoretical, but um, given the fact that Olaf is undertaking investigations in Frontex and Eurojust at the moment, it's not completely hypothetical either. We'll see down the line. Well then last but not least, and this is where I come in, uh, I suppose as a representative of one of the 22 member states, the 21st in fact, we were not very keen to join from the very start, but we did in the end and we have been very loyal since. Um, according to the regulation, there was an expert group under Article 20, Paragraph 4, uh, chaired by the Commission where we discussed a host of issues ranging from the draft internal rules of procedure to the draft conditions of employment, CMS, case management system, data protection issues, draft budget, um, which was useful in a sense, even though it wasn't always enjoyable, I, I have to confess, and Luca will confirm. You attended quite a few of the meetings. Um, 
Unfortunately, despite repeated promises, the Commission has uh, discontinued uh, this type of meetings uh, once the college was in place, which, strictly speaking, is in line with the regulation, but still a missed opportunity, I feel. Um, so what, you, what we have now in practice is that there are bilateral contacts between European prosecutors and ministries of justice and between the EDPs and the national authorities at operational level. But they are very much dependent on the personal style or, if you like, the charisma of the European prosecutor involved. Um, so there's not a single approach to these type of contests, particularly at the policy level. Um, However, and this is where my concern lies, college decisions may indirectly oblige member states to amend their legislation and face financial implications. I will mention two examples, um, the first one being the conditions of employment of European delegated prosecutors and the other one operational expenses incurred by them. I already referred to that. The, for me, the problematic part in this is in, in, in that in both these situations, the college, faced with budgetary limitations, uh, has, um, I will use a diplomatic term, stretched the regulation in order to legally justify the shifting of the financial burden of these costs to national authorities. Um, where, whilst the consequence, consequence of that ironically perhaps, is that um, it led to ad hoc and unsatisfactory solutions for the EDP's concerns, which in the end uh, became entirely dependent on the goodwill, or if you like, on a more banal level, financial support assistance from the member states, which definitely raises issues in relation to their independence. You can't have it both ways, after all. Uh, so if, if anything, I'm not sure if anyone's taking notes, any point we need to change in regulation is the status of EDPs. That is clear. Um, furthermore, I wonder, does the EPPO really wish to convey the message to member states that it doesn't really care about what national budgetary rules are in place or uh, tell them to, to, to just write the check uh, I don't know. Uh, to, to me, it, I, I, it doesn't seem like the ideal route to win hearts and minds in national, um, among national authorities, to be very honest. Um, I, 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 I generally find it questionable, if not even fundamentally objectionable, that the college, by taking certain decisions it sees fit for whatever reason, could end up exercising a kind of quasi-legislative powers that affect member states without, at the very least, having consulted them in the process. I mean, I, I, I'm not exaggerating. Some member states have actually had to amend their national legislation as a result of these college decisions. I find it dubious from the point of legal underpinning of such decisions and even democratic, democratic legitimacy. Again, uh, a number of member states asked the college to be consulted on the very first decision on the conditions of employment, but that request was sadly ignored. Final actor I, I should mention are the national parliaments. Uh, they will also receive the annual report and may invite the chief for a hearing to discuss it, uh, in which case the deputy might appear, as I explained earlier on. But what is the situation in, in case something goes seriously wrong? I'm asking this from the reality in the Netherlands where the Ministry of Justice is politically responsible for the actions of the uh, um, Public Prosecution Service, which to some of you may seem odd, but we've actually had ministers having had to resign uh, after controversy about a case that happened many years ago. I'm thinking of a deal with the criminal that didn't go well with Parliament when it was known 13, 14 years later. And the minister at that point actually had to resign because of that. I'm not saying that the minister should, because the EPPO screws up, excuse the expression, but um, let's take an example. That, that during a house search, the um, investigative authorities arrest um, a suspect who has a heart attack or tries to, tries to escape through the window, falls down, 
and dies. In my country, that would lead to question to the minister, how could this happen? How will you prevent it in future? I think there's no such arrangement for the actions that take place under the supervision or authority of the EPPO. And that may create tension at the national level if they take place on the territory of a certain member state, which they will. In conclusion, um, I would say that the, the, the sacrosanct concept of independence should not be interpreted as an absolute one, an exclusive one. Nor the Venice Commission in 2010, nor the court in its jurisprudence on European arrest warrants define independence of judicial authorities in such terms. In fact, I will quote another Council of Europe recommendation, which the college kindly mentioned in its recent letter on the disciplinary rules, its recommendation 2019 on the role of public prosecution in the criminal justice system, Point 12 says, and you'll, you'll understand I was happy to find this, public prosecutors should not interfere with the competence of the legislative and the executive powers. There you go. Um, so this, this concept not being absolute um, should hold, I feel, with the exception that I mentioned at the start, there should be absolutely no interference in individual cases, period. That brings me to the conclusion that the EPPO should not operate in, in a vacuum on, on top of Kirchberg, you know, the, the mountain in Luxembourg, who is it technically a hill? Uh, to a Dutch person, to a Dutch person, this would soon be a mountain, but um, should, should operate on, on Kirchberg. Um, nor should it wish to, to realistically expect that it's, it's non-operational commandments. You'll forgive me for the biblical analogy, I, I, I suspect. Uh, I don't want to touch on any religion's feelings here. To, to be executed one-on-one -on -one without at the very least having some sort of contact with the member states affected by them. Um, another conclusion is that there, there, are, there are very, very strong administrative and budgetary links to the European Commission. So what is the identity the EPP is seeking to have? Is it to be another DG Apple or something? Or is it a, a, a true prosecution service? That's a choice to be made. There is a form of democratic control by uh, the European Parliament, be it that the general attitude in the European Parliament is very benevolent, as I've explained. There might be by national parliaments in the longer run, uh, particularly in, in situation of incidents like the ones that I have described. There's a very limited role for the council, uh, hardly one for the group of participating member states, except at the operational level and individually, and in a subordinate role, subordinate to the EPPO. So that all of that leads me to the, um, the impression that there is a kind of institutional imbalance in combination with um, a regre regrettable democratic void at the national level. Is that the end of the story? No, 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 I have an epilogue. Um, and I would, I, I would say that given the hybrid nature of the EPPO, it, it would appear very wise if the college were to begin reflecting on the strategy to better involve the group of participating member states in its work. Or put differently, a strategic mistake to approach them with a sense of institutional superiority um, based on this one-dimensional notion of what independence entails. Uh, let's not forget, and, and this is not meant to be as a threat, uh, to, be, to be very precise. Um, in, in fact, it was mentioned by Danilo, I think, this morning. The EPPO's effectiveness is, in the end, very much dependent on the assistance of member states. So it would seem highly advisable to treat them as partners rather than as subordinates or the enemy, even. I'm not saying that's happening. I'm just trying to explain the concept that I'm trying to get across. <laughs> Um, you know, if need be, the Commission can sort out the member states any time they'd like. You know, if, if the Commission feels their legislation is not in order or something or inc incorrect, that's the Commission's role. But I, I would warn the EPPO to step into that same role. They should be distinguished. Um, I, I, I think I can probably tell what the reaction to my um, uh, plea will be 
namely that the, the regulation does not oblige the college or the EPPO as such to, um, to reach out to member states. No, to, and even so, I mean, um, is there an explicit obligation or uh, prohibition in the regulation to apply common sense? No, <laughs> there is not. Uh, so I hope that the, the college will um, take this plea on board at some point and that, that, that it will reach out to, um, to the participating member states um, as a collective at policy level again, uh, rather than through the individual EPs. Uh, you know, uh, being in Rome, um, we know the concept of uh, divide et impera was invented here. Um, and, and it is widely applied in the European context, but I'm just saying <laughs> it may not be very effective. Um, and, and if the Commission uh, would be happy to, to, to facilitate a dialogue, a form of structured contact between the EPPO and member states, fine. Let's, let's call it a forum. Uh, the, the, the Commission could even chair it, you know, fine. And, and what's in it for, for the EPPO or the Commission? What are the likely benefits, in other words? I think quite a few. I think it will help to build trust, to enhance the legitimacy of the EPPO, to ensure support on the Council side anyway for its budgetary needs. I just remember the Council could have um, a leverage could bring leverage in the complicated budget negotiations. It would help in um, ensuring support in operational matters and other areas. Um, it would definitely help the EPPO to understand the full implication of its decisions for member states. It would facilitate the practical implementation of the obligations under the um, regulation. It would ensure equal rules uh, and uh, arrangements for all and, and thus promote uh, the notion of a single office rather than um, the traditional geometrie variable or diversity that the EU is so used to. I think I will leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>
cornerstone and it's the counterbalance of independence or autonomy. And um, there might be the risk that you're pointing out. My question here is, within the accountability and efficient spend, spending of resources, what should be the guidelines with regard to simplified procedures? So, because... <laughs> We don't have harmonization. I think there should be more harmonization in order for the EPBO to work more effectively uh, regarding simplified profit seedings and, and, the, and the general uh, European landscape. Uh, there should be more harmonization on admissibility of cross-border evidence, and there should be also more uh, um, harmonization regarding the statute of limitations. Why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because uh, the regulation says that uh, there should be um, the college shall issue guidelines regarding uh, when and how to apply simplified procedures, so a plea agreements and other type of negotiated justice forms. In some countries, there are no general, general um, negotiated justice forms. It's like in Sweden, and so or that might be uh, that, that might be also an element or a factor to be taken into account when reallocating a case or um, trying to um, identify where to lead the investigation. Yes, Article 26.4 says uh, the investigation shall be led and handled where the focus of criminality is, but um, there, there, might be other, there might be other issues um, taken into account and changing that, as you all know, that allocation, a territorial allocation of the investigation when when several uh, countries have jurisdiction of the, the, those crimes. So residents, that the elements that are mentioned in the regulations are residents, nationality, and and where the main damages has occurred. My question is. These changes of allocation of cases, territorial allocation of cases, have to be taken into account um, by the principle of uh, public interest. But public interest in accordance with the criteria of reallocation, this is nationality, residence, and uh, main, where the main damages have occurred. Um, I think there might be a a contradiction because public interest might be justifying the relocation of the case to the jurisdiction, to the territory where the statute of limitation is longer, there is negotiated justice more efficient or more possible or allows for this case and to institute other simplified procedures or where the admissibility of evidence has lower standards and lower thresholds. So um, I'm not sure if the public interest can be interpreted like this, but I think there might be guidelines to be issued. Um, and this is a question I put to you because you are at the at trenches and the front row um, dealing with these issues. So um, how are those guidelines to be drafted, applied, and if this in particular public interest might be extended to other issues different from 26.4. And uh, finally, um, um, what happens um, with the, when you were talking about the conditions of employment and such uh, legislative, so to say, legislative power, um, by the college, that there might be the risk to extend the legislative power and uh, interfere in, so to say, the balances of power and, and counter checks of our democracies. Uh, I don't see that. I don't see that risk immediate, but uh, theoretically and in abstract, uh, we have to think about it, of course. But um, do you think, do you think uh, really it's more... Um, Dutch perspective, because the PPs are very much linked to the Ministry of Justice and are accountable to them. Because if I see here the, the management powers of the public prosecutors in the member states of the European U Union, 
Um, it's, it's in fact Netherlands one who is very much directed by the Ministry of Justice, but not all of them. No, so um, that would be my questions. Sorry for taking too much time, as always. Thank you. Well, as much as I agree that uh, we could and should have a unified EU legislation on simplified procedure and admissibility of cross-border evidence or statutory limitation, uh, I, I, this, this, these points will not influence the decision of the EPPO in any way. It's, it's, we will never, ever consider where it is more convenient to allocate a case because there is simplified procedure or evidence is admissible more easily or statute limitations are longer. This, this, really, this is really out of the question. We don't even start thinking about that. I, I, I would like that. I would like to have a criminal procedure code. I mean, like one, of, one of the things that when, when, we, when we started talking to the Defense Lawyers Association at, at the European level, and and uh, and they were yelling for 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 having a European Criminal Procedural Code because they 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 are they are aware and as, as we are aware that these discrepancies might create a negative effect and also a a perception of choices based on this. But there is really nothing we can do. I mean, Article Forty about simplified procedure of the regulation starts with a if. If in a member states there is a simplified procedure, right? It means that it's not like that in all the member states. Yesterday, I don't remember who said it yesterday. In Italy, you can actually kind of enter a plea agreement for almost almost anything. And in France, it's it's almost impossible, right? And <laughs> that makes a lot of difference. But the statute of limitation, we know that in Italy it's it's a big issue, right? Whereas in other member states, there's no way. I mean it's like this is really irrelevant. So uh, we are very, very, very aware of these differences, right? And, and, uh, and that, that, that is not a point that we'll, we will never ever take in consideration when reallocating a case to another member state or making a decision to enter a plea, plea agreement or, or, or whatever. Uh, the, the, the idea behind that, I mean, so I can say that so far we have not reallocated any case. Okay. This is actually, I have to say that we are far from that. We, I mean, personally, I don't see cases that have a potential for reallocation at the moment, but it will happen in the future. Yeah, and that's, that's without a doubt. Uh, but th this is what we take in consideration. And guidelines about simplified procedure, maybe Ingrid might want to say something about that, but, uh, but about... Uh, criteria for allocating the case to a member state or another, we might adopt them in the future if we see that operationally this becomes an issue. If, if we have no real issue with that, we will not adopt guidelines. But if we do have, we will adopt guidelines to supplement the regulation. Of course, we cannot go against the criteria of the regulation, but we can supplement. And we have the, 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 the exceptional job that you just did uh, throughout all these years about that. Thanks. Um, just to add a couple of words concerning simplified procedures. Um, in, in fact, the college um, has adopted guidelines on simplified procedures, who, um, oh, which uh, hopefully are on our website and actually I was part of the team preparing um, preparing the, the guidelines and I must say obviously member states legislation and in fact we have to um, apply national law in that respect uh, which if, as Danilo has said is absolutely crystal clear from article 40. Uh, member states legislation in that respect varies tremendously. Uh, whether there will ever be an approximation or even harmonization of simplified procedures in the member states, 
that's a question for the EU legislature, a question of political will, but I could expect that this would also be, from a legal technical point of view, incredibly tricky. And I remember, I don't know whether Professor Ligeti is still here somewhere in the room, but uh, I remember the attempts to uh, create the model rules, which should have been a basis for something like a joint criminal procedure code for the EPPO, which um, obviously there, there was the lacking political will, shall we call it like that, to go for something like that. But then I think it also turned out to be incredibly difficult to really um, execute it, carry it out from a legal technical point of view. Because actually, uh, if you were just a little bit one provision concerning the investigation, you have to make sure that the result at the end of the proceedings will be the same. Can you then, would that be a ground to challenge the decision if there is infringement of, of, that, uh, of that provision, for instance? All that is, is very, very difficult. Now, concerning the simplified procedures in the member states, actually, we learned that uh, in, in some states, simplified procedures can only apply uh, to can only be applied to minor crimes, such as in my country. In other countries, actually, the simplified procedures are there, uh, particularly for the major crimes. Then we have learned that in some countries, such in my, uh, as in my country, you first have to terminate the investigation and establish what has happened, establish the facts, and then you um, apply a simplified procedure, whereas in other member states, actually, you apply the simplified procedure in order to not have to uh, complete the um, lengthy uh, investigation and really establish um, in detail what has happened. In some member states, you can apply it uh, to, to companies. In others, you can't. So we really have a variety. In some member states, it's the prosecutor's office, um, applying the simplified procedure. In other states, the prosecutor can just make a proposal to the court and it's the court doing it, or it depends on the, uh, the stage of the proceedings. So really, we have a lot of variety there. Full stop. Let me pick up on uh, one or two points um, that you mentioned. As to Article 40, um, the reality is that this is a compromise achieved under our presidency, precisely because some member states do, do not accept the concept of uh, a transaction, as it is called in Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria, uh, and, and find it barbaric, <laughs> basically, from a legal point of view. They cannot envisage a situation where uh, such a deal would be struck without a judge being involved, to the more pragmatic type, such as us. It's a very efficient way to end a potentially very long criminal procedure. We've had cases of uh, transactions involving 700 million in relation to big banks. Now, I'm not saying that this is ideal, and in fact, the Parliament has asked for better rules on this because it got a bit out of hand in practice. But the, you know, the principle as such uh, is still uh, accepted widely. Um, so this this Article 40 simply um, reflects the, the differences between the member states. Those that have such a kind of procedure um, will allow the EPPO to take advantage of it, and those that do not, do not. It's basically as simple as that. It's a, it was just a very pragmatic solution to something, a discussion that had been ongoing for a very long time uh, that we wanted to solve. Um, what else? Yes, I'm not sure what graph you were showing me, um, which makes it difficult to react. Uh, so in very general terms, I will say that under the Dutch legislation, there is a possibility for the minister to give instructions to the prosecution service. The reality is that he never does. Um, even so, looking at a, a court case in Germany where there was a similar system, we have adapted our law on the surrender uh, in line with their jurisprudence so that European arrest warrants will now be issued by a judge rather than a prosecutor. And there is a discussion based on a report that I've just received about the 
status of the prosecution service in light of such jurisprudence um, in general. So that will be a very interesting debate because just suppose that we would uh, take that theoretical possibility from the minister away out of the legislation. There would still be many links, financial ones, administrative ones, there would be the political responsibility unless uh, based on the report that we are now studying, the conclusion would be that the um, Board of Prosecutors General would be, would be directly responsible to Parliament, for instance, which is a, which is a possibility that some member states has, have. The Prosecutor General goes to Parliament if something goes wrong. Other member states have a system where the prosecution service directly negotiates with the Ministry of Finance to ensure the budget. All these modalities are foreseeable. Um, so is it a typically Dutch point, this concern about the impact of college decision? No. Um, various member states have reacted in different ways. Some have a tradition of adapting legislation. We have found a more practical solution, be it a bit contra -cur. Um But my point is that the impact of the decision is that the EDPs at the national level have become financially dependent on national authorities. And that, in my view, raises questions as to their independence. It could anyway. So that was basically the point I was trying to make. Very briefly, I don't have much to add on the question of the simplified procedures. As Nicholas rightly recalled, during the negotiations in the Council, there were very long discussions and uh, which hit the, the, the obstacle represented in substance by the different approach in relation to what effect a simplified procedure has in terms of uh, assessing the historical fact and uh, uh, establishing a measure of uh, criminal liability of the person that accesses it at present. There was no possibility to get out of this some pass and article on simplified prosecution procedure is one of the most useless articles in the whole regulation, may I say, because it basically says, do as you wish. <laughs> it's a bit a reflection of the hands-off approach that the regulation has in relation to um, the decision on the, on the res judicanda. So anything that happens in relation to courts is left to the courts. The regulation doesn't enter into it at almost at all, to be fair, the initial commission proposal wasn't exactly of high ambitions uh, in this respect, so we'll see what happens in the future in practice. Uh, just one um, observation in respect to your idea of, of uh, harmonizing the rules for cross-border evidence to uh, recall to myself in Article 82, the only ground which has never been, not only not exploited, but never even proposed to be exploited in terms of uh, approximation of uh, criminal law, is the one on cross-border evidence. So it's, it's clear that in this respect, uh, the European Union has still vastly inexplored territories uh, that only wait for a uh, courageous explorers to go explore, <laughs> eventually at some point. But uh, who knows, maybe the EPO, uh, with its intrinsic cross-border nature, can be a groundbreaker from this respect and, and show in practice what are the obstacles that indeed will have to be uh, addressed at some point. Um, so thank you very much. I, I will now open the, the floor. Um, just one, one last reaction. Um, of course, I'm, I'm very much aware on the discussion and negotiations on Article 40 on the regulation and that the terms of transactions and agreements were, were deleted from it and, and substituted by simplified proceedings. Um, my point is, my point is that since it's the public prosecutors who promote and who take action, active action towards um, um, simplify uh, clear agreements or, or other negotiated solutions. And despite that there might be some European Union countries that are still against the Council of Europe recommendation of 89, it's very clear. And those it, in general, it's recommended to apply more efficient uh, simplified proceedings and move towards discretionary uh, prosecution. So since 89, and I would say um, it's exceptional in the cases that uh, European Union countries have not introduced any kind of uh, plea agreement or a speedy track 
um, disposition of the cases. And this is my precise point. You say, the regulation says, do as you wish. And do as you wish means that the delegated European public prosecutors should do as they wish, but they wish. What is that they wish should be kind of directed by the guidelines on the EPPO, because otherwise the different delegated prosecutors will be kind of shifting towards or, not, or, or blocking um, 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 discretionary solutions or um, negotiated justice. That was my question. And uh, precisely because I know that the landscape on, on solutions is so diverse. And um, thank you for, for addressing the 82 uh, non-developed <laughs> article of the treaty. And the uh, courageous explorer is going to be me because I'm leading a European Union project on admissibility of cross-border evidence and the possibility of drafting some European Union rules um, beyond what the model rules were. So I only count of you to help and provide your input because that might make your life easier, I think, I don't know. But uh, anyhow, the audience, please, questions and answers, we are willing to hear them. Um, is the micro somewhere to already clean and please Hans Holger well, thank you very much to all of you for the insights to how the Apple works in practice I have three questions two of them simple ones but maybe not so simple to answer and a third one that is a bit more complicated the first simple question builds on something that Ingrid uh, spoke about uh, that is the reports to the EPO and the initiating of investigation my question is to what extent does the EPO receive reports I mean not on evocation cases but on new cases receive reports at the central office and to what extent at the national uh, the EDPs do you have an rough percentage and connected with that to what extent have you been receiving reports from eu institutions or bodies for example from olaf presumably olaf has many cases in the files which could potentially be relevant for the app can you say something about that second question article 31 you all know that uh, this was heavily debated and uh, and a lot of speculation whether it will work in practice. Can you say something there yet already? Uh, experience with the complicated system of Article 31 of who is in charge of judicial authorization and the concept of a single authorization. The third question, uh, a bit more complicated. You spoke about uh, Article 40. Uh, my question refers to Article 39. You know that uh, the recital says that the that the catalog of dismissal grounds in Article 39 is uh, a, a final list of dismissal grounds. And the issue has come up in the past whether and to what extent national provisions on dismissal can also still be applied by the EPO. And my question is whether the college has an idea about that, whether any issue have come up already. Uh, for example, uh, questions of a temporal dismissal or a suspension of investigations. If you are investigating Mr. X and Mr. X, however, is in Russia and Russia does not surrender the person to the airport, what do you do? Do you then finally dismiss the case or do you suspend the investigation and who takes that decision is that the role of the chamber to do or does the edp simply decide on that or a different uh, uh, scenario where you are investigating mr x uh, because he has uh, allegedly been committing five cases of smuggling five separate cases of smuggling and four of them are perfectly clear you can go to court any day and the fifth one however is more complicated to prove it will not make a difference in the end because the person will get five years imprisonment anyhow but do you then have to continue investigations for case number five until whenever you find sufficient proof or can you partially dismiss the case against Mr. X and only bring the four cases to the court and again the question who decides on that is that the EDP or is there a role for the chambers thank you I was I was looking for the for the statistics, but I'm not really finding that one. But 
but uh, I can say that we receive a fair amount of information from private parties that we, we and then in that case, we have a very, very, very small percentage of cases that we effectively initiate based on the claims from the private parties, uh, less than 3%. Then we have a large amount of information and criminal reports that we receive from the national authorities. I would say they make 70, 75%, something like that. I don't know, Ingrid, if you have the statistics exactly there, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just well, just just to be precise. Yeah. Yeah. By far, uh, it is. Yeah. Well, we have like uh, around fifty percent of the criminal report received from the national authorities, around 40% from private parties, 10% from basically OLAF and to a very minor extent, the European Investment Bank. But then when we go to the cases that we actually initiate, uh, we have around 85, 90% from the national authorities. That is the main source when it comes to quantity of our job. By, by far, I mean, like I, I can say that even without looking at the statistics that confirm this, but it's our everyday experience in as supervisors in EP and in the permanent chambers. That's that's without a doubt. Uh, well, Article Thirty One. <laughs> I was supposed to talk about that, and there was no time. But <laughs> I might want to say something about this. Uh, well, I mean, like the the real added value of Article Thirty One here of cross-border investigation is the fact that differently from whatever happened up to the 1st of June 2021, we take action as a single office. That's the big revolution. That's, that's really different from any Eurojust coordination meeting, any European investigation order, any joint investigation team. We just sit together around the table, coordinate the ADPs, take, check, take action together. So that's, that's easy if only the prosecutor is involved. It's very easy and we do it very quickly. We just understand the case, we talk to one another and the assisting EPs, EDPs just take action under the coordination of, of the central office. Uh, but then the big deal is when the judges are involved. Then, then the, the, the scenario changes uh, totally. That, that really changes because we are facing difficulties uh, because the way Article 31 is drafted is creating some different interpretations that we will have to assess. We created already a steering working group to see whether we can issue guidelines or, or let's say, have a, have a common understanding about that. Uh, basically, the, the big news is you are not going to use the traditional tool of mutual legal assistance even within the EU you are not going to use the mutual recognition tools, right? So, and you're going to have just one judicial authorization. That's the principle. Yeah, but it's, real life is not like that. <laughs> so it's, if, if, I, if I have a case in Italy where, where I have a freezing order from the Italian judge, and then I, found, I find that there are funds in France or in Austria or in Germany, uh, well, no. I need also the authorization from the German judge and the French judge. And, and what does the French judge want? Do they want the certificate that the, the regulation, the mutual recognition? Well, but we, we are not supposed to use it. So what, what are you going to give the judge? Nothing? No, he wants something. <laughs> so uh, at least the freezing order issued by the Italian judge. But then I have to translate it. So the, 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 certif the certificate was quicker. So how, how are we going to do that? So you see, there's a lot of uh, very complicated issues, but the principle of the single judicial authorization does not work. That's really impossible to use because in order to take action, whenever it's a, it's a freezing, it's an arrest, it, it is obtaining uh, telephone data, uh, it is, you know, any kind of even invasive uh, investigative action requires the authorization of a judge. Not to talk about interceptions, things like that. 
we always need the authorization of two judges, <laughs> almost always. If judges are not involved, as I said, well, easy. Uh, just, I just uh, wanted to say something about dismissal and and uh, and plea agreement and that let's say uh, alternative uh, Article Forty. Well, these are decisions of the permanent chamber, and it, uh, also what, what you said, uh, Lorena, it's, it's, it's not an erratic decision of 140 different ADPs. Uh, it is a permanent chamber. It is in Article 40. The permanent chamber makes decision on applying plea agreement. So there is a centralized approach. There are guidelines. And, and, and the, the 15 permanent chambers really take all the horizontal issues to the college. We, we do it every week, actually, it's, it's, and it's very <laughs> tiring, but we have to do it because we, we need to have consistency. We need to be coherent throughout the 22 member states. So that's, a, that's something that we have to do beforehand in order for the ADPs to have clear instructions, general instructions, not on the specific case, general instructions on how to behave. And, th and that, the same goes with dismissal or suspension, because of course we are going to apply the national legislation, which is different in different member states, but if we have to take a decision on dismissal, it's again, the permit, this is Article 10, this is one of the essential tasks of the permanent chamber. So that will be also centralized. We, we, we haven't encountered yet problems related to surrender or European air support or things like that. It's, it's too early. We will see. But anyway, there will be a centralized approach. For, you can be sure about it. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Just to add a couple of words. Um, indeed, what the permanent chambers are mainly uh, doing at present is uh, to decide on which cases we take which cases we evoke, and uh, which cases where we initiate proceedings. I mean, always on the basis uh, of uh, the, um, the, the provisions according to the regulation that uh, when the EDP wants to invoke, uh, evoke a case, he, she does it, and then the, the chamber start monitoring the investigation. Um, and the same goes for initiation. So there the EPs go ahead only when the EDPs um, uh, suggest not to evoke a case or not to initiate, that goes to the permanent chamber for decision making at this stage. These are mainly the decisions that the permanent chambers take at present. We also had uh, already uh, ref uh, case referral decisions though, and we had instructions already from the permanent chambers uh, given to the EDPs um, on case referrals, um, instructions on initiation of uh, proceedings, instructions on evocation of proceedings. But uh, I, I would like to uh, highlight the importance of what Danilo has said. Obviously, legal issues will pop up. The legal issues Hans Holger has highlighted, they will pop up at a certain stage. And then we will have to bring these questions to the college because actually there is no, um, at least for my country, that is something very alien. There is no competence for, for the chief prosecutor to give instructions on how the permanent chambers should decide. That is uh, exclusively a role for the college to ensure coherence and consistency of the decision making of the permanent chambers, and that obviously will have an effect on how the EDPs will take their decisions. So, um, and I think we will we will take uh, the legal issues, the legal questions, as they pop up, and try to find solutions. Um, if you ask me personally, as for Article Thirty Nine the grounds for dismissal, I would read the regulation such that um, they are exclusive, it's a closed list, and any additional grounds for dismissal enshrined in national law would not apply. But that is my own reading. And once we have the first cases, 
where this question arises. We will discuss it, and by that time, we will then hopefully have an EPO opinion. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, we are very much looking forward to more questions. So please, there's one asking for the micro there, Valas. Um, 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 I remind you just to, or even if many of us already, since yesterday, we know each other, but uh, present yourself, please. Is it on? Is it? Yeah, okay. So my name is Balazs Garanvölgy. I'm a prosecutor in Hungary, so a non-participating member state, but I'm here on a private capacity, so I'm not expressing any official views on that, but uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, in the coffee break, I had a phone call from one of the German EDPs because I'm working at a department which is designated in the cooperation agreement for operational cases, and they practically identified a based on a EIO uh, linked case, which a Hungarian case, which is linked to a Hungarian, uh, which is linked to a German uh, EDP case. So just to tell you that practically it's it's working, it's moving on, and it's still it's it's really really happening now. And um, as Ingrid also mentioned, we we already had a case where we had a I don't know four or five country involved uh, in a cooperation, and it was really smoothly uh, handled and everybody was really happy. I think I will frame the email of the German prosecutor thanking for the smooth and quick cooperation for, for, for future purposes. Anyhow, this is not what I wanted to ask. Uh, my question is that uh, I have the impression that uh, it, in an ideal world you would have to deal only with, uh, with operational questions and, uh, and uh, legal questions. Uh, con in connection with your operational work, but since the setup is as it is, I think you, well, this is my opinion, but I would like to know more <laughs> more about your opinion on this, your take on this, that uh, you eventually can't avoid to develop uh, a stance on policy matters, because eventually the EPPO will ask to express opinions on, for example, independence of the prosecutors, not only the EDPs, but in in a more broader uh, sense. And also you you will have to develop, in my view, a stance on on policy matters like abolishing the 4200 custom procedure, which is which should have been done decades ago. We all know, but when this opinion comes from the EPPO that could make a difference at the European level. Also reversing the VAT system and abolish the cash use of cash and so on and so on. So if you really, so in my view, the EPPO can, could really impact uh, the roots of the problems, not only handling the symptoms as the cases are usually. I don't know what your take is on this issue, but I would like to know. <laughs> Thank you. Who wants to address the question? The comment? Now, um, I think the, the, the regulation is, is very clear now. The European Chief Prosecutor represents uh, the EPO um, towards um, third parties towards the outside world and uh, the European Chief Prosecutor is in charge of the management and the functioning of uh, the office at the college and you I would actually agree with you Balash the uh, college um, is in charge um, uh, of strategic matters general issues arising from individual cases uh, obviously ensuring coherence, consistency of decision-making. And actually here I come with my Eurogist experience. Um, the Commission has, and I think still does and will continue, to ask Eurogist uh, for Eurogist experience and expertise when it comes to issues uh, related to 
um, cross-border investigations, um, serious crime, um, mutual recognition, mutual legal assistance. And I take it that um, in the future, the Commission will also consult the EPPO on uh, policy issues when uh, the Commission wants to make a proposal for any legislative act. Plus, in addition, uh, the EPO uh, will have to report annually to the stakeholders, and this will also be an opportunity for us to actively and proactively highlight issues where we think uh, there's a shortcoming in the legislation, um, be it uh, either on EU level or uh, uh, at national uh, level implementing EU provisions. And indeed, that is something, there is a role for the college based on the experience um, with individual cases. But at present, we are not yet there, to be honest. Uh, just uh, a few more words uh, about this. It's, it's, we, we, we are very, very careful when it comes to expressing a policy to the outside world, right? It's, it's a very sensitive issue, and we know what that means. And it's, we have a lot to say about technical issues. Custom Procedure 42, we, we, we will have a technical opinion, we will be consulted, there's no doubt about that, right? But independence, well, we don't need to have an opinion on that. It's already there. Mm. And we are just standing by. This is, I mean, this is like, like the basic, basic principle of our work. So, I know I, 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 I'm coming to that. And, and, and are we going to say that this should be a value throughout all the prosecutorial service of the EU? Well, but there is a quite landmark judgment of the Court of European, of European Human Rights. It's Kobeji against Romania, <laughs> just accidentally. And that says it clearly, clearly, very clearly, straightforward. And one of the big, big implications of this is, I mean, uh, we, we've been reminded of the mechanism of dismissal of the European prosecutor, European chief prosecutor, which is in the regulation article 1416. But there is a big, big problem with the status of the European chief prosecutor, the European prosecutors, and the European delegated prosecutors, because we are temporary agents. So we are like functionaries. We can, it, the, the disciplinary procedure for functionaries and temporary agents cannot be applied to us. It's written in that judgment. So what can be applied to us? Only 14 and 16, but there is no procedure there. There is nothing. It's like the appointing authority. Which, which, what is the appointing authority? The, the chief prosecutor is appointed by three different authorities. We are appointed by the council, which is the most political and less democratic institution in the European Union. That's, that's impossible. We don't have a disciplinary procedure. <laughs> we don't have a disciplinary procedure. It's only, there's only this reference in Article 14, 16 about dismissal, but disciplinary, there's a lot before this dismissal. And w w the only clear thing is that the court of justice, but only for the dismissal. <laughs> Anything else? There is nothing. So that's about our status. For, for sure, this independence of the judiciary and of the prosecution has consequences on this. And we already brought it to the attention of the commission, eh? for sure. But then, again, it's not our opinion. It's, 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 it's already jurisprudence. It's already in the regulation. We are not going to fight for this. We are a prosecution service. We, we, we are, this is not our role. But I think this is already in, inside our DNA then not implemented in a lot of member states, yes. It's a different story. Thank you. I mean, you touched upon one of the um, main issues that needs to be addressed, I think, at the uh, European level, which is 
uh, if we want really to provide some autonomy to the public prosecution and functional independence, uh, the disciplinary proceedings have to be regulated um, much more in line with what is the judicial independence disciplinary proceedings law. So following, as you mentioned, the European Court of Human Rights and the Volkov case uh, should be also here applicable to prosecutors, I think, because this is one of the main problems. And um, but um, I think um, I don't know if, you, if you're um, envisaged to provide some kind of code of ethics for the for the EPPO. So that's in. Okay, you already have it. So, and the disciplinary proceedings, I don't know, and how far. Um, more questions, more questions, please. Because, I mean, this uh, is a very lively discussion. I was thinking about uh, how, do you, how do you deal in practice? This is out of complete ignorance. So mixed cases, a case where um, you find out an EPPO case, for example, Germany, and uh, you start investigation there. And uh, it appears during the investigation that the main focus of criminality is a non-EPPO country, for example, Hungary. In such case, um, you try to go back to the mutual recognition cooperation systems and implement the EIO. Do you resort to, to Eurojust in order to find who will have jurisdiction or do you just split the cases? Well, that's that's an easy answer. It's a yes. <laughs> that's, that we have to we have to use the European investigation order where possible. With Ireland and Denmark, for example, we cannot. They don't have it. So there, we have to go to the, the old MLA system, and uh, where we have a working arrangement, like with Hungary, we use it. Where we don't, we use the tools that are available to us. Brussels 2000 or more problematic, much more problematic. But you um, split the case, or, or uh, you try to oh, uh, decide no. with Eurojust? No, uh, Eurojust is involved, if needs be, yes, absolutely. We have a working arrangement with Eurojust as well. So, yeah. Um, split the case, well, we have to see. We have to see how the case is, what is inside the case. This is theoretical. But uh, everything is, anything is possible, actually, yeah. <laughs> But uh, we have the tools to cooperate, certainly with the non-participating member states, certainly with third countries in the Council of Europe area, and with a few third countries, because uh, European Union has already agreements with the UK, with the US, with Japan, and they apply to us. And then we've been notified as competent authority when it comes to United Nations Convention on Corruption and Organized Crime. So that we have some tools. Strasbourg 59 is the most problematic, anyway. As for the question of whether we would split the case, actually, the question is, would there be a jurisdiction in Hungary for the case? If so, I take it that uh, I think Hungary has the principle of legality mandatory prosecution. I think the Hungarian prosecutor's office would have to initiate um, an investigation and then there would be obviously be parallel investigations, one conducted by the EPO, one conducted by Hungary, and what comes to my mind immediately is this lovely instrument of having joint investigation teams, which is what you apply at present when you have um, public prosecutor's offices in different member states conducting parallel proceedings which is a successful instrument and a, a very good, uh, very good uh, practical possibility to coordinate. And, uh, um, well, and once you have set up the joint investigation team, you would not even need uh, a European investigation order, but could um, easily, easily uh, coordinate um, measures, investigative measures, um, conducted by both authorities, and the the results, uh, the evidence could be shared easily. If no joint investigation team is set up, then obviously it would be mutual recognition instruments. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, Madam Chair. Can can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. We don't Thank see you. you. Yeah, we can sorry, see you. sorry for being a party crusher. 
I'm Janning Aram from the Court now of, we see you. of the European Union, and thank you very much. I've been following with much interest from Luxembourg uh, the, um, the discussions. Thank you for all the, the speakers also yesterday, very interesting. I'm going to be in the panel this afternoon, but I, I had to want to two um, remarks between a remark and a question. The first is about uh, Nicholas' um, intervention about accountability um, and the house search uh, going seriously wrong. Um, it's true there's no minister which you can call then uh, to, to discuss it, but um, I thought about uh, Article 113 of the regulation which talks about uh, non-contractual liability. Um, so action for damages. I think uh, Olaf also knows that it should be taken very seriously, such actions. Uh, they can, uh, can be quite, um, uh, yeah, quite effective. It's not just about getting money, the damages, but it's also about controlling what happens. Uh, so uh, and I think uh, um, the house search going seriously wrong could be brought before the general court by an action for damages, which would allow a certain form of control and therefore accountability on, on what happened uh, at that occasion. Uh, that's my first point. It's a remark or a question as, as you wish to see it. The second one is about um, disciplinary uh, procedures. Um, uh, I think you, most of you know that on the 30th of September, so just a week and a day ago, uh, the Court of Justice rendered in its plenary, plenary court uh, a judgment in a case Court of Auditors against a former member of the Court of Auditors, which I don't have to mention here. And it's about 120 pages long, the judgment, and there you can very well see what serious misconduct is. Um, so you don't need a definition of serious misconduct, I think, uh, to know what it could be. And even if you have a definition, you will never have it in an exhaustive way. Uh, with regard to the procedure, um, and I'm talking here very personally, yeah? so uh, to paraphrase Nico, uh, Nicola, uh, if you don't agree, don't call the president of the Court of Justice. Uh, but uh, go, uh, the, the procedure, um, it's true that the, the EDP, uh, um, that you're all temporary agents, but on the other hand, you have the EPO regulation, so which is a Lex Specialis, uh, which, which uh, Lex, Lex Specialis derivat Legi Generalis, so it's not just the staff regulations or the, which become uh, applicable to you. I would see it as EPO regulation uh, is, 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 is a special law applicable. And to, to talk about the procedure, we have at the Court of Justice Article 6 of the statute, which allows uh, judges also to be dismissed, uh, a, bit, a bit the same way uh, as it is formulated in the Apple regulation or as it is formulated for commissioners or for members of the Court of Auditors. But we don't have a procedure for that. I mean, we live without procedure. Okay, we haven't had a case until now. Um, but also in the case of, of the Court of Auditors, uh, you don't really have a procedure. You have somewhere uh, a decision-making procedure to bring it to the Court of Auditors. Uh, I mean, how should it be decided to bring it to the Court of, uh, sorry, to the Court of Justice? But that's the end of it. Uh, so uh, I, may, I might be seriously wrong, but I don't see the problem. Um, as long as you say that the EPO regulation is a lex specialis compared to the staff regulations, then for me, the problem is solved, unless you see another problem. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your intervention, even if it's uh, remotely. Um, anyone wants to address this? Otherwise, and yes, of course. Um, thank you, Jan, for that observation. Um, you are right, of course, um, in the sense that there is a mechanism for um, seeking to um, achieve some sort of uh, compensation in, in, in the case of civil liability. But that was not actually the problem I was referring to. My case is about the, um, if you like, political consequence of uh, something going seriously wrong in the sense that somebody should take the responsibility and at least reflect on uh, a way to avoid 
such a similar situation happening again. And the question is whether the EPPO would do that, and if in the longer run national parliaments would be satisfied with the fact that they cannot tell the minister or anyone else uh, to sort out um, the mess. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think we can conclude this very interesting and lively panel. I think we all have learned a lot and I think we, you all have a um, um, difficult road ahead, but also a very inspiring, challenging and uh, passionating uh, role. Um, I thank you all for your patience here, for your contributions. And uh, just one, one last comment uh, with special thanks to this wonderful, wonderful uh, speakers. And um, a, a very, very happy birthday for Nicolas, who has birthday tomorrow. But um, he undertook a lot of work already in advance, and we, if we are not having the chance to congratulate tomorrow, thank you. And happy birthday for tomorrow. So we see, um, we resume later at, um, I think, just for you to know, 2.30. Have a good lunch. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress.
Bene, grazie. Possiamo riprendere. Thank you. We can um, resume. with the um, afternoon session that is always more complicated. Um, our topic for this afternoon is particularly interesting. It's a new OLAF regulation, which has some positive um, aspects and um, it does not change the preventive role that OLAF plays in the investigation role, which will have to be less pronounced in the case of EPPO, but it leaves many issues unresolved and uh, we cannot expect everything to be written down right away. The, the articles from 12A on which I've introduced innovations um, include aspects that have not been so well regulated, such as the discipline concerning possible conflicts, not just because b between OLAF and EPPO, but also between OLAF member states and the member states which recognize the EPPO and particularly member states uh, states that don't. Investigative coordination in this sense, I think, is one of the um, biggest issues. I will not take any more time from the speakers and I give the floor right away to Caterina Kimici whom I've known for a long time and, um, well, we have been friends <laughs> since the second half of the last century. Um, so we give her the floor for her presentation and then perhaps I will ask a few questions. Thank you. First of all, good evening to everyone. I wish to thank Mr. Biriteri for saying that we have been, um, we are old friends and um, I'm particularly happy to be here today. I wish to thank the Basso Foundation for inviting me to participate in such an important conference. I'm sorry I could not participate in the other sessions, but um, I was in Strasbourg for the uh, plenary European Parliament session. I, I could only be here with you today with other distinguished speakers with whom we are going to share this task of sharing some thoughts about the um, your situation at the European level and the measures that have been adopted at the European level to protect the financial interest of the European Union. It is a notion that uh, over the past few months, but I think over the past few years really, uh, has played a very important role in political uh, debate also at the academic and case law level in the legal field. And it's always important to say that when we speak about the financial interests of a union, we speak about the financial interests of a European citizens. So this uh, leap forward that was made by European legislation in order to protect more effectively the financial interests uh, of the European citizens and uh, to fight against every form of offences and uh, unlawful behaviours, misconduct and connection uh, to the financial interests of the Union is something that should be shared and that should be also hailed and welcomed warmly and that should um, also eliminate sceptic or, or bias that mm, may be there in connection with the construction of a more compact European uh, space. And I think that this aspect has already been highlighted during previous contributions. And in this field, within the field of a renewed commitment at the legislative level and at the European level in order to fight against all forms of uh, offences can connected to the financial interests of the Union, it is in this context that we should play the new OLAF regulation that was adopted in 2020, 2020 2223. I was uh, a shadow rapporteur in this uh, in the drafting of this regulation 2020 
and I was um, precisely a shadow rapporteur within the Committee on Budgetary Control. The new OLAF discipline should be placed within the framework of our new commitment by the European institutions to protect the financial interests of the union. The first was the PIF directive that you already spoke about, I'm sure, and that was adopted during the previous um, legislature and that our country integrated, transposed in its uh, system in July 2020. The second important step, I think, was the regulation that established the EPPO. Um, after establishing the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which, as we know, has a specific role um, to protect and fight against financial offences, the criminal system aspect should have been further developed in order to protect the financial interests of the Union. And that, and that is why it, it was decided to adopt this regulation President Biriteri made some reference uh, to possible issues that may emerge. It is possible that they do, but I have to reassure you in the sense that just as it was um, the case with the regulation on the EPPO and as it normally happens in the case of those um, legislative acts or measures that have a significant impact, um, we're speaking about criminal offenses, which of course are more of a more sensitive nature, well, it's always easy uh, getting to a text that is shared, and I can testify to this because I worked on the new OLAF regulation, how complex the interparliamentary negotiation was, so within the various political groups and in holding different positions as well as the positions of countries and also the interinstitutional negotiation. So I think I can safely say that the um, text that eventually was produced, was drafted, is um, a text that is important, is valid, and um, highlights also the relevant role to be played by OLAF that carries out administrative inquiries, but also... Um, investigates on criminal offences, and that must cooperate with the EPPO. So the new regulation on o OLAF was developed, was aimed at developing OLAF's powers, strengthening its relations with member states, promoting cooperation between member states and OLAF, and then trying to regulate as precisely as possible, the relationship, well, cooperation with the EPPO, establishing synergies and exchanges of information, um, strong cooperation, and a true complementarity between EPPO's activities and those carried out by OLAF in order to avoid uh, overlaps or conflicts we, we shall see because we know that the EPPO has only just started its activities so we will then have to look at its functioning and cooperation between the two offices. From the standpoint of strengthening all of some activities I think that a new element is represented by the fact that Olaf was given the tools that allow it to follow the money trail, an experience that we are very much uh, conversant with, uh, follow the money. It's an English expression that we know well in this country, but I wish to state that uh, um, I was, in a sense, the person who developed it because this comes from the first difficult in investigations that were carried out in Sicily by Rocco Chinnici, Paolo Borsellino, and Falcone. So follow the money, but the idea of following the money is something that comes from the Italian experience. I, if I may, Giovanni Falcone used to say, uh, money has the heart of a rabbit and the legs of a hare. So it's easily scared by investigation and it runs away very quickly. So that is why it's so difficult to um, get hold of it. But the past has traced uh, a path 
And uh, another personal comment I would like to make, I am a member of the European Parliament because I committed to bringing the Italian experience that has caused so many sacrifices within the field of European legislation. So I am proud of results that were achieved at the European level at a cost on these topics. So getting back to the specific topic, one of the new elements that to be highlighted within the field of strengthening the investigative powers of OLAF is precisely the fact that OLAF was given the necessary tools allowing it to follow the money trail. In the sense that the member states are obliged to communicate at the written request of the office, highlighting again the importance of establishing true cooperation relationships among the OLAF office and individual member states. So upon the written request of the office, they are required to communicate information um, available through automatic centralized mechanisms, which allowed um, the timely identification of any natural legal person holding or controlling payment accounts, bank accounts, or safety deposit boxes were strictly necessary for the purposes of investigation. The competent national authorities are also required to provide the office with a record of transactions. Another important aspect is that of cooperation, um, not just with the EPPO, and I will quickly um, expand on it, but also with um, Eurojust and uh, Europol, concluding administrative agreements with the two agencies, which may include the exchange of operational, strategic or technical information, and possibly also, where appropriate, progress reports. And I think what is particularly significant is that in the uh, working agreement that was recently concluded between uh, Olaf and Europol, uh, that agreement opens with the common awareness of the urgency of addressing the challenges posed by international organized crime, including terrorism and other forms of serious crime, um, and the links to illegal activities detrimental to the financial interests of the European Union. And in this sense, I wish to also add that among the first to raise um, the alert about possible infiltration of criminal organizations, for instance, in the management of European funding, which is going to come to our countries to help the member states uh, uh, come out of the financial crisis caused by the COVID pandemic. Well, one of the first was a national anti-mafia um, prosecutor. And um, again, with a view to strengthening the OLAF and its um, investigating investigative uh, sorry powers to be able to carry out investigations in cooperation with the EPPO, we can say that there are also other aspects uh, and I move on quickly, there are also other aspects that are particularly important and that have been included in the new regulation. First of all, on-the-spot checks, on-the-spot checks and inspections. Another aspect is uh, admissibility as evidence of the reports drawn up by the office and also strengthening um, anti-fraud coordination services of the member states. As to on-the-spot checks, uh, it should be highlighted that the new discipline seems to be more streamlined compared with the previous one. If the economic operator concerned by the investigation voluntarily submits to the on-the-spot check and inspection, and in this case, uh, the reference to national legislation um, does not apply, mm, but the legitimacy of the procedure followed by OLAF will be assessed solely on the basis of the of European law. Another, another important aspect um, is overcoming the so-called rule of equivalence, um, the principle according to which OLAF reports are admissible as evidence in judicial proceedings on the same basis and under the same conditions as the administrative reports drawn up by the national administrative inspectors and are subject to the same rules of evaluation applicable to the administrative reports drawn up by the national administrative inspectors, also sharing their evidential value. Thanks to Article 11 of the new OLAF regulation, 
the rule of equivalence remains in force only in the case of criminal proceedings uh, where the rules of admissibility and usability of evidence are notoriously more sensitive than in other proceedings. And this is going to be a problem, as uh, Mr. Pirateri says. Again, um, with the view of um, making all of action more effective um, in this direction, there is new Article 12a, whereby each member state shall designate a service, anti-fraud coordination service, to facilitate effective cooperation and exchange of information with the office, including information of, a, of an operational nature. So we hope that this can provide an answer to those um, um, worries, preoccupations that were raised by Mr. Buriteri. So I quoted these articles to highlight how in the new regulation, what was done was we tried to focus on and strengthen some essential aspects, such as the exchange of information, cooperation, um, coordination among the union EU bodies and the competent national authorities. Of course, we then have to see what happens in practical terms uh, and how this regulation is enforced. Another important aspect, and I try to quickly draw my conclusions, has to do with the relations between the OLAF, the Anti-Fraud Office, and uh, the EPPO. Because in this case, too, um, it will be necessary to, to to regulate appropriately, and this is what was uh, done with the new regulation. So to regulate relations in a better way, to make cooperation between the two officers as effective as possible. And in fact, the regulation states that uh, that relations that should be regulated through specific provisions. So the relations between the two officers shall be based on mutual cooperation, the exchange of information, complementarity, and avoidance of duplication. And I wish to also add uh, also avoidance of potential conflicts. And um, Mr. Biriteri said so already, but the relevant articles are articles 12 quarter to 12 octis that uh, regulate the coordination of the work within the European Public Prosecutor's Office, starting with uh, the reporting of criminal conduct to the EPO by OLAF, if administrative inquiries um, identify um, unfounded allegations or... So in this way, in the regulations, we try to identify areas of investigative competence that are contiguous but that are not overlapping to the point that are so much so that un according to Article 12 Quinquest, the new the Director General of OLAF stops an open investigation and does not open a new investigation if EPO is conducting an investigation on the same uh, facts. But this relationship that we may define uh, as being a joint investigation between the two institutions is well balanced by the possibility for OLAF under Article 12 subtis to carry out complementary investigations, complementary to those already opened by EPO, if the Director General considers it appropriate in duly justified cases and subject to the obligation to inform in writing the, the EPO, which could Pose OLAF's initiative if it considered that this would jeopardize the continuation of its own investigations. Because without saying that um, when a complementary investigation is carried out, this must be carried out in close cooperation between the two authorities on the basis of a periodic exchange of information and evidence so as to avoid unnecessary duplication and also a waste of the resources employed in the investigation activity. And I would also like to quickly quote uh, Article 12 Octis, that is the provision which is really the cornerstone of the relations between OLAF and the PPO. So 
um, the fact that the office OLAF must conclude working agreements with the PPO in order to also establish practical um, processes for the exchange of information. And this uh, exchange of information is very important uh, for the purposes of the relations to be established between OLAF and the PPO. This article um, was put into practice. I don't know if this was mentioned already um, by previous speakers. So this this um, article was put into practice last July with the signing of a working agree agreement between the Director General of OLAF and the European Chief Prosecutor, Mrs. Tovesi, who um, last week illustrated the beginning of the EPPO's activities, highlighted the importance of its activities as um, an essential element in order to protect the financial interests of the Union, and also highlighted that it is necessary for the EPPO to be supported by all those who are in involved in recovering European assets, particularly OLAF. Um, I would like to conclude by saying something that I've already hinted at. I think that the introduction of the new regulation for anti-fraud, European anti-fraud office within the framework of a European legal system, which compared with the past, is uh, much more advanced in terms of fighting um, against financial offences detrimental to the Union, well, this goes even beyond the simply strengthening the institutions that are responsible for protecting the financial interests of the Union. And I think that this regulation, the PIF Directive, the PPO and the new OLAF regulation really um, go in the direction of establishing a, a space of uh, protection, justice, uh, and freedom, as described by um, Article 3, Paragraph 2 of the European Union Treaty. So it's essential for judicial cooperation um, and investigative coordination must play an essential role in fighting against crime in an effective manner, fighting against organized crime, which, because it hacks at the transnational level and because it makes us, makes use of the, high, of the most sophisticated technologies, really represent great risk in terms of distorting uh, markets and also in terms of um, financial offenses. And I wish to conclude by saying, by, by quoting um, Covesi, Prosecutor Covesi, who before the Court of Justice uh, recalled um, Italian magistrates such as Rocco Chinici, Giovanni Valcone, and Paolo Borsellino said that in order to protect the financial interests of the Europe, um, what we do is really protect the interests of the citizens and therefore the values of democracies, democracy and the rule of law. And I think we all agree on that. And um, thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank Caterina Kinnici. It is a very stimulating and crucial aspect. I had sort of uh, felt that I would ask you a question, which I'm no longer asking you. The question was, is there a danger that Olaf may be changed into a sort of a, a body that is at the service of EPPO? Uh, but you said it very clearly that uh, what is at stake is a com complementarity. It is a synergy between the two bodies to sort of ensure the best possible results in detection of criminal uh, associations uh, which are sort of affecting the financial interest of Europe uh, with uh, sort of in a very 
professional form of transnational organized crime. Well, looking from the perspective of national uh, judges, uh, we would sort of hope that uh, in the coming years we might uh, eventually create a corpus of rules which are agreed by everyone, also in terms of uh, criminal uh, law and uh, penal law. Uh, you have Lex Lachi and Lex, uh, uh, where the sort of the, the trial is uh, organized before the French judge, the Italian judge, and the Portuguese judge. So with different procedures, that is the actual most crucial problem. The question of guarantees is, is okay, the problem of the form of a trial is different from a different country in different countries. In terms of the criminal proceedings, it's extremely important that Europe becomes convinced that it's important to have a sort of set of rules which are homogeneous and in keeping with the regulations, with the same sort of uh, rationale that led to the establishment of the uh, National Directorate to combat mafia activities uh, with a view to sort of strengthen and enhance the uh, fight, especially where investment, a very huge investment at stake, and the um, criminals uh, groupings uh, are very keen on uh, trying to get hold of such resources. So I'll give the floor to Ernesto Bianchi, and, and I had uh, sort of uh, uh, wanted to ask a couple of uh, questions of him. Well, the operational framework of Olaf uh, in light of the new regulation. Uh, well, the new regulation has uh, taken into account the need for uh, sort of a loyal collaboration. Uh, from 1 to 18 or 19, uh, well, this is something which is being uh, pointed out uh, throughout. And then there is uh, the 12, uh, Article 12, that says that there shouldn't be any overlap in investigations. Um, Olaf should not overlap its investigation with, with those of EPA. According to what uh, Caterina Kinici told us, uh, well, we could interpret this, uh, uh, that we have to avoid uh, duplications. Uh, uh, what, how can we achieve that? Uh, what sort of arrangements uh, can we consider? I think that there are a number of governments that have in mind this possibility. So your position and your view is very important in terms of knowing what are, which are the sort of techniques that can be used for this type of uh, uh, investigations which are complementary but not ancillary. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Before uh, to, to shifting to English, uh, because I, I have everything written in English, I'd like to thank uh, uh, once again uh, Caterina Kinici for the amount of work that she has carried out during the very difficult negotiation on the new um, Olaf regulation happens with Olaf now that we have the airport in place. Uh, there's been uh, quite a lot of uh, discussions. Rivers of ink have already been poured. Uh, lots of words. Um, I would like to uh, start with that need to improve cooperation of loyal uh, cooperation of building trust that I also introduced yesterday when I was uh, explaining to you what Olaf does in terms of building knowledge, collecting knowledge, and using the knowledge that we that we have. Um, and I'd like to begin from exactly where uh, Mrs. Kinichi stopped, and that is uh, that uh, that uh, announcement of the uh, adoption already of an agreement between Olaf and Apple, which was a very important moment for us. We did not build that, and it was a deliberate intention of the, uh, of the chief uh, prosecutor and of my director general. We did not build it on paper. It is built on practice. We started very early having uh, coordination meetings 
uh, a technical level between Olaf and EPO, precisely to make sure that we would cover as much as we could foresee in that agreement, and by developing ways of working together that are based on dialogue, are based on sharing, are based on cooperation, are based on trust. And I have to say, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to, to use an expression that uh, uh, my former colleague Luca De Matteis used this morning. Uh, you said, Luca, that the Apple legal framework has resisted the impact of, the, the impact of reality. Uh, the new uh, legal framework of Olaf as well, as well as the cooperation or the beginning of the cooperation between Olaf and, uh, and Apple. So we're very, we're very happy about that. Uh, prosecutors and enforcement uh, uh, authorities in the member states were already used to working with Olaf. We're not new. We've been, we've been there 20 years. We have already an experience of really working side by side with judicial uh, authorities in the member states. Now they're EDPS. So some of, uh, of those links and connections were already there. Now we are developing uh, more and more uh, the connections. We transferred, we communicated over to the EPO roughly 150 cases uh, that we were aware of. And for each one of them, there's been bilateral meetings to discuss between the investigators and the EDPS involved, the content of the case, so that the information and that sharing of all we know is there from day one. And that has, of course, uh, assisted, we think, uh, also the colleagues, uh, the, the, the EDPS, the EPO, in uh, making choices about what to take, when to take it. And of course, that's also the beginning of new uh, collaborations on those cases and on other cases. We have uh, il already 11 cases of complementary investigations that are confirmed. Uh, so the, the structure of the complementary investigation works and the added value is clearly visible for EPO and for Olaf. Those are cases where there will be no duplication because, as Mrs. Kinichi was saying, those cases are going to be based on uh, the two teams working closely together. And, of course, uh, with uh, the uh, understanding that everything that we do in, uh, in our administrative um, work in, in Olaf cannot inter interfere with a criminal investigation by the EPO. That is already uh, the case. We have five more uh, complementary investigations that hopefully will be confirmed. And these are all cases in which we will be able to do the trick of allowing to, uh, it's especially the case for customs cases now, but it will then go on and move on to expenditure as well, manage the trick of running after the money and making sure that the money is uh, stopped from being uh, spent. Uh, or recovered quickly when that can be, uh, and at the same time, uh, in a way, prepare the ground for prosecution by, uh, if you want, doing the technical work uh, that lies behind trying to track down what has happened with the money, with the financial fraud, and how uh, fraud schemes were put in place by exploiting, as I, as I, as I told you yes, ye yesterday, gaps in administrative law and in administrative practice, uh, which is an increasing trend that we see. So the, the, the trick in making uh, EPO and uh, Olaf work together is really in handling that complexity. We've heard yesterday afternoon, we've heard this morning as well, how complicated it is to make the, uh, the EPO uh, regulation function. And of course, that level of hyper-crystal clarity from a legal text is not possible. So at the end of the, of the day, it is obvious that the practice makes uh, the difference. Um, what we do in Olaf, what we have been doing in Olaf, and what we will continue doing in Olaf, that's the value of the complementary, that's, that's what we bring into uh, this relationship with the, with the EPO, is our experience in uh, uh, managing to follow the money quickly, administrative investigation and the access to bank accounts is a very good weapon because we, are, we get to see uh, bank account transactions much faster. Uh, we can do that across Europe uh, and we can reconstruct uh, situations that are 
take a bit longer to do if you, if you, if you take the judicial route. Uh, and that is definitely uh, something that we will continue uh, doing. We can also recommend precautionary measures. So there we can see in certain situations that a project has been half funded, there's still half to be funded. In that case, we can issue, and we do issue very quickly, uh, recommendations for the line D DGs not to pay, to take precautionary measures. And there's no better way to follow the money than, to, than, than preventing it from leaving your coffers in a, in a way that's, that's, quite, that's quite strong. The other thing that we have been doing and we will continue doing is trying to close those loopholes. We call that administrative recommendations. Um, we know the inside working of um, the, uh, the Brussels legal and administrative machinery quite well. It's, it's a complicated world. Uh, we see that uh, you really need to have that specialized knowledge that you only get by really working years and years and years in Brussels through the complexity of the systems that we, that we have. Now, making administrative recommendations that make sense is not so easy as one would think. Uh, for example, this morning I heard the idea ventilated of, okay, well, this customs procedure 42 is something that we don't like. I think it was you, Balash. Let's scrap it. Well, the, the practical consequences of scrapping it is that Unilever will have to actually incur a lot more costs in importing stuff from outside Europe into Europe if you scrap it completely. So exactly you're doing the balancing act. There is uh, much value and much work that we need to do in looking at what we can recommend administratively that makes sense, that we need to discuss with our policy colleagues in DGs like DG Trade, uh, DG Grow, because of course, you know, we can't stop the economy because, you know, if there is no trade, there is no fraud. <laughs> that's, not, that's not good enough. So it, it is that really uh, complexity of handling this kind of situations. And of course, as uh, as Mrs. Kinichi know, one thing is for a commission department to make a proposal to the council and the parliament, and another thing is to get that proposal adopted by the council and the parliament, not only in terms of time, but the content that comes out of it. So sometimes it's, it's easy, easier, and that's what we are trying to do, for example, on Customs Procedure 42, to look at improving the ways that it is implemented rather than scrapping the whole thing. I know you look skeptical, but uh, there's ways of doing that, and we hope uh, that we, 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 we can. Uh, we also have another line of business that hasn't really come out in this context because we are really referring to uh, the OLAF regulation. OLAF has another task that the Commission has given to it uh, years ago, and that is the task of carrying out customs mutual assistance work. It sounds bureaucratic. It's called Regulation 51597. That is what we are using, more and more actually, uh, to do what yesterday I described as connecting the dots, as building the bigger picture of, uh, of fraud and fraudulent schemes. Um, we've used it, for example, for uh, our inquiries on COVID face masks uh, quite a lot, where we actually saw uh, that there was no attention paid whatsoever uh, to linking uh, the customs work with the work of the certificate check that what we put on our faces is okay to put on our, on our faces. Huge gap there. It was a blind spot for everybody and it was okay to have a blind spot in the first three months when face masks were impossible to find, but it is not okay now. So again, there's a lot of work that we need to build there. Uh, another example that I can bring, for example, is uh, on refrigerant gases, where we have, just by looking at uh, loopholes in administrative law and administrative practice in the member states, we see now a huge traffic of counterfeit refrigerant gas. This is what we put in our cars, this is what we put in our homes uh, to, 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 to condition our houses and cars in, uh, uh, throughout the year. And the, the gases that are contained in there are, are actually toxic, toxic or can destroy the environment, the ozone layer. Um, this is, again, connecting a lot of authorities, even inside the same member state, that did not use to interact with each other. Uh, and it's something that uh, we do. It is time uh, uh, consuming, but more and more we find uh, 
this aspect of poly criminality that we are working with Europol uh, together uh, to try to fight it, of organized crime investing in these new lines of business, in the face masks, in the refrigerant gases. Another example I can give you is in exporting plastic waste. It is illegal to export unsorted plastic waste from the European Union to a third country. It is not so difficult to circumvent it. Uh, I remember when I arrived in Olaf, I was shocked uh, when the, my colleagues were explaining to me the practice of transshipment that was happening in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in all exotic places. Well, now we find transshipment of, uh, of illegal plastic wastes inside the European Union as it moves from one member state to the other to find a good outlet to leave the European Union. Our yogurt boxes, uh, vases that we rinse every, every morning end up in dumps in places like uh, Malaysia and children play around them. They're burned at night polluting the environment there, but it's our environment, it's one planet. So these are all things that uh, we're busy doing and again with great connect, with, with not great, with sad connections with organized crime every time is polycriminality uh, for you. So it is really important that we have a system that allows to leave no stones unturned. We need to look at the administrative side just as well as we need to look at the criminal side of facts. Doing one thing only does not deliver the same result. And I think this is what um, the co-legislator, which is incarnated here today by you, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Kinichi wanted from the new architecture. An architecture that can be confusing, that can be puzzling, can be difficult to see now, but we really have to make uh, work. And uh, we will, uh, of course, do all we can to make sure that we do, uh, do that. Uh, a word on expenditure, because I've only spoken about customs now, but there's expenditure too. I mentioned yesterday the challenges of next generation EU. Um, we are talking about uh, an enormous amount of money that needs to be spent in three years, roughly. Um, almost 800 billion euro. That money will be spent with an innovative scheme. That innovative scheme basically gives a lot of responsibility to control, audit uh, bodies in the member states, often also at regional level. It certainly the case in this country, but not only of this country. And uh, there what we see again is um, this interest that has already been highlighted by, by Europol, but we see too, already in the preparation of hundreds of fake companies in countries where it's not so difficult to register them. They're there already, ready to intervene. Uh, and it is really going to be very important that we manage again here the miracle of making sure that the information, this information, goes everywhere from Tallinn to Lisbon. It is not easy, but that's what we have to do. And again, that it goes from Tallinn to Lisbon, that it goes from Europol to EPO to OLAF to Eurojust in this coordinated uh, way uh, of, uh, of working together that is uh, something that is a challenge for all, for all of us. Um, now, I wanted to, uh, to, 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 to look also at, um, I, I mentioned it yesterday very quickly, at another point that has been uh, highlighted, I think, uh, by you, President, and that's detection. Uh, detection is, again, something that uh, we, we can't do alone. The capacity of a national or a regional body to detect a bigger fraud scheme is a, a cross-border, a European or a world cross-scheme, is, is very low. You only see a tiny little section of it. Uh, we had a, a case uh, that we presented in the OLAF report this year, a couple of years ago, when there was, uh, in, in this country, there was a, a criminal investigation going on, on organized crime. So there were phone tappings, and in these phone tappings, all of a sudden, the Italian invest investigators here, something mentioned about buying agricultural machines from somewhere. 
and they listened in to what they, the, the, these, these people were saying, but they didn't really quite get the bigger picture. Uh, so they came to us and they asked us to help them reconstruct what was going on, explain what was going on and reconstruct what was going on. It took us about four or five months. Uh, and essentially it was, and that's why the, uh, the Italian Guardia di Finanza couldn't really understand the bigger picture. Uh, these were uh, agricultural uh, machines bought from Germany at about three, four times the price. Um, the payments were made to a company in Romania that would then move the money on to Bulgaria. So this is all deliberately done so that you, know, you involve more jurisdictions and then following the money becomes a problem. The kickback payment was not just money returning back, no. They had invented, it, was, it did not exist, they had invented a system of sales uh, from a, a Bulgarian company to a Romanian company that would then resell but all different bank accounts to a company in Italy of um, dry tomatoes that, of course, never passed any border and never passed any country. There, were, there, there was paper, there was money, but the dry, the dry, the dry tomatoes were not there. And it, it is really only by looking at all the administrative movements uh, and looking at whether there were physical movements of the good that you can reconstruct in an administrative investigation what is going on. And uh, the, the money involved in, its, in, in itself was not huge. I think it was 10 million euro. But, you know, again, it, it really gives you the, uh, the picture of this uh, organized crime now acting in rather in smaller um, uh, crimes, smaller, relatively smaller crimes, of an administrative nature because they're really hard to find. And that's our challenge and that's where we have to uh, beef up uh, cooperation uh, at all levels, at, uh, at, European, uh, at European level, at, at national level. So we've been preparing, as I, as I, as I said, we, we put everything in place uh, to do that. And the good news that I can bring to you again is that we, so far, we haven't had any problem. We haven't seen any situation in which we were discussing with the colleagues in EPO a potential conflict. We didn't detect that at all. So if we all know what we are doing in a system that works for the same aim in, in an environment of trust, I think that's not going to be really a problem. And of course, we have to, com to continue uh, working closely and making sure that we share information, that we trust each other as much as possible. Uh, and this applies also, uh, President, to a system that includes in this cooperation network, also the countries that are not part of the EPO, because they are still part of our system. They are authorities that protect the internal market. They are the authorities that, uh, at the end of the day, implement European policies. And we, we, we have learned it. If we don't have European policies that work as European policies, we fail. Uh, so it, it, it just, I'm, I'm not going to go into, into, into more detail on this, but really to tell you, to give you this this message of optimism, uh, so far, so good. And, uh, of course, we will continue doing all we can with our colleagues to, to work uh, in this condition for the protection of the financial interests of the EU and for the protection of the citizens of Europe and the credibility of Europe itself. Thank you very much. Grazie. Uh, Ernesto Bianchi, mi scuso per... Thank you, Ernesto Bianchi. I apologize for not greeting all those who are following us remotely when we started this session, but I am very fond of um, live meetings and sometimes I forget and do not do my job as I should. Thank you, Ernesto Bianchi, because if we need to prove that reality is complex, well, I think you gave ample proof of it and also confirmed the central role played by farming, since from tractors you got to dry tomatoes. It's always fascinating in this sense what happens. But I think I can get, I can draw from your presentation a message of great optimism concerning the future effectiveness of investigations protecting the financial interests of Europe. And I see that as being rooted in history. Um, some 40 years ago, 
When we started understanding what Cosa Nostra was, the mafia, judges started speaking with each other. So the various uh, judges, such as Rocco Chinnici, um, were investigating individual offenses. So in a sense, we were only seeing some part of an of offenses separately. Then we under, when we realized that we had to see that as a phenomenon, as something global, then we started really fighting against crime, uh, a type of organized crime that has evolved, that has become European and international. Well, I think that being in contact with other experts um, has uh, really stimulated me. Uh, and what I would like to share with you in this sense is the following. The presence of EDPs in Italian PPOs, there are many in Italy, small international ones, uh, you know, Rome, Palermo, Catania, of course, some of them are have no problem with the PPO, sorry, with Olaf, but there are some uh, small PPOs that have never cooperated with Olaf, even though they could have. And um, now I hope that through a greater awareness of what the EPPO is, because we, we have it here in our own country, we can start a, um, a system marked by a greater cooperation, also in small investigations where you see that there is where there are, uh, you know, problems such as, you know, the structures that are going to be turned into dry tomatoes in the future um, to then be placed uh, in some can uh, and perhaps ending up in, uh, in as canned tomatoes in some European high security reasons. So with the hope of future effectiveness, and we know that Italy has an excellent investigative system because we were affected by organized crime and terrorism for a long time. We were the first in Europe to have been able to develop uh, a system of um, uh, or to fight against this phenomena. So we can really act in synergy and help and help the smaller PPOs grow. Uh, officers that perhaps uh, in the past few years uh, were not involved in, in this European um, investigative system that uh, has now been put in place. I would like to, uh, to tell Diana that there is an aspect, the fifth paragraph uh, um, has the entails the obligation of stopping investigations when Apple investigations are started. How can we recover this sort of step in the sense that we, so that we do not uh, waste resources and we, we acquire data? Sure. So I think I will touch upon this point uh, towards the end of my uh, presentation. So I'm not, uh, if you allow me, I'll not respond uh, immediately. Uh, and, but before starting, I would like uh, to join the other speakers to to thank the organizers of Fondazione Basso for uh, inviting uh, all of us to this very, very interesting conference, which uh, deals with the uh, interesting and important topics, I would say. Uh, and I would start by uh, referring to the title of this conference, which is the new anti-fraud institutional and legislative landscape. Uh, we've heard a lot until now about the PIF directive, about the EPO, EPO regulation. Uh, so we, we know until now a bit more about how EPO functions, the problems that they face uh, in practice. So we discussed a lot about a new actor, a new, if you if allow me to say this, a new kid in a room, okay? But this uh, session, this afternoon session is dedicated to Olaf, which is, I would say, the old actor in, uh, in this in institutional uh, landscape. An old actor with 22 years of experience, which we, as Ernesto said, we, we, we are trying to use now to, to support EPO and to, to work together in this uh, new uh, framework, new, new landscape. Um, and uh, again, as Ernesto highlighted, Olaf continues to, to work as it used to work until now uh, in those member states which do not participate uh, in the EPO. So, our role uh, uh, is, is different now. It has changed a bit, but there is a lot to, 
which comes uh, from the past. Um, and uh, precisely because of these changes, it was uh, necessary uh, to, to change also all of regulation. We heard uh, a lot uh, until now from the legislator point of view, it was very interesting for, for, for me to, to hear someone who participated, who was in the, the heart of the negotiations. Uh, we heard also the, the point of view from an operational point of view, from, from someone who is conducting an investigation. So my presentation today will be more from, from a legal point of view. I'll try to complement and not to repeat too much what was uh, said uh, until now and uh, i would uh, say that um, I, I want to to point out to two two major things why was this regulation changed it was changed because it was necessary to allow Olaf to work better and to work with the apple to work better we heard already Olaf needed to have more uh, stronger investigative tools, but it was also necessary to, to ensure more coherence between the rules, more coordination with the member states. Uh, it was necessary to have more clarity on some specific rules which were already in the regulation, but when applied in practice, the reality showed that uh, it were, they were not so, so clear. So in the end, there was a set of rules which needed uh, to be changed to, to reinforce Olaf. But on the, on the other side, Olaf was given, I would say, more powers, more tools, stronger tools. But it was also necessary to, to, to set a better balance, to improve the checks and balances which were already in the regulation. And this is why uh, I would say that a very important achievement of Olaf regulation was uh, uh, the fact that uh, whereas the procedure, I mean, the changes uh, that were made did not affect the procedural guarantees uh, which were already in the regulation, um, the, the protection of the procedural guarantees has been reinforced, I would say, significantly in a very important manner uh, by two novelties. Uh, on one side, uh, there was a function of controller of procedural guarantees which was created. On the, and on the other side, um, of course, to, to help the controller function, there was um, a new procedure which was introduced in the regulation. Regulation and this is the complaints mechanism. And I would, uh, uh, I think, with this, I, I already gave you a flavor of uh, my uh, next points. As I said, I will try not to repeat too much what was uh, already said. I will just point out in uh, in a few words uh, some the most significant changes and why were they were important for for us. Uh, so when it comes um, first to the investigative tools which were improved for Olaf, uh, Mrs. Kinich already mentioned the, the fact that uh, there was uh, this new provision which, uh, which was about uh, the obligation for, for national authorities to, uh, to give access to information on bank accounts and transactions. So I will not, uh, I will not insist uh, too much on this. Uh, another very important tool which is uh, quite new, we'll see how it uh, will work in practice, uh, is the, the provision which allows Olaf, Olaf to inspect privately owned devices, which are used for work purposes. This is um, something which is, uh, uh, I, we feel already as lawyers, it's something which will be quite challenging to apply in practice. Uh, the principle is the same in external and internal investigations. Olaf will be in, uh, able to inspect uh, devices, private devices, which are owned, uh, used for work purposes. Of course, this is, um, I would say, an intrusive means of investigation, which means that it was also necessary to, uh, to introduce some checks and balances, to, to, to introduce some, some, some safeguards. Um, and uh, these are a bit different depending on the, the type of investigation. So um, what is common uh, is the condition to conditions, Olaf can inspect such devices if it has reasonable grounds to suspect that the content of these devices are used, uh, are relevant um, uh, for the investigation. Um, and if, of course, the private devices are used for work purposes, uh, it goes, I would say, even uh, it 
it's natural that this is accompanied by, by principles of uh, necessity and proportionality. What is different in the two types of investigations is the fact that in external investigations, um, Olaf's powers are uh, have to, to be subject to the same conditions as uh, the conditions that apply to national control authorities, whereas in internal investigations, Olaf's powers may be subject to specific conditions which are to be set up by the EU institutions, bodies, agencies, etc. Uh, so we'll see how in practice this will work because uh, these are ongoing discussions. It's not something which has been already implemented. It will come. Uh, I was mentioning also uh, the fact that it was necessary to ensure more coherence between the existing rules, better coordination, and without giving, giving too much, too many examples, I would only mention the fact that, uh, for instance, there, the, at some point there was a better uh, alignment of provisions between uh, concerning internal and external investigations, but also. Um, uh, between the provisions concerning uh, what happens when Olaf does not open an investigation, even uh, when it has uh, suspicion that has been about corruption or uh, illegal uh, activities affecting the, the financial interests. Uh, the new provisions ensure that Olaf transmits the relevant information to uh, competent authorities and also that uh, Olaf takes um, into consideration any possible interference with the uh, ongoing investigations by the EPO. Uh, Mrs. Kinich already mentioned uh, the fact that there is now more clarity concerning the law applicable in the course of on-the-spot checks and inspections, so I, I would not insist on, on this point, but for us it is very important because this is precisely the case when we saw that uh, the rules were the rules in the regulation, in on the spot check regulation plus Olaf regulation, but in practice it was different. So based on, on Olaf's practice and the case law, I, and I will mention here the, the judgment Sigma Orionis versus Commission, so uh, the, it was very good for us that uh, the legislator clarified the, these provisions. Um, and because I, I uh, mentioned the, the coherence, which uh, was uh, uh, one of the, I would say, the achievements of uh, the changes in the regulation, I would, uh, I think it's uh, important to mention that uh, in the context of on-the-spot checks and inspections, there is this obligation of the uh, member state authorities to, to assist OLAF. Uh, and in uh, one of the recitals of the OLAF regulation, it is very important that um, it is said that the Commission can take or should take uh, the member state's failure to comply with the duty to cooperate with OLAF into account in considering whether to recover the amounts uh, concerned through the application of financial corrections. And why is this important? Because also in December 2020, when, so last year when uh, OLAF regulation was changed, there was another very important regulation which was adopted, and this is the, the so-called conditionality regulation, uh, which allows um, acting, um, uh, allows the commission to uh, to act when it is established that breaches of the principles of the rule of law affect or seriously affect um, risk affecting the sound financial management of the union budget. And one of the cases this or situations which are mentioned in the condition, conditionality regulation when uh, it is possible to, 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 to act is lack of uh, effective or untimely cooperation with OLAF and with the EPO. So it is important to, to, to have uh, in view the, the whole picture. Um, one last point that I would mention just as a title, but without uh, uh, entering into details, is the fact that uh, the new there are new rules which uh, um, are, I would say, um, are about more effective and more consistent use of Olaf's reports. And Mrs. Kinich already mentioned that the rules on the admissibility of Olaf's reports as evidence in criminal proceedings. But what is new for us, and it is also very good, is the fact that these reports are admissible evidence also at EU level, uh, meaning, for instance, uh, uh, in uh, administrative and judicial proceedings before the Court of Justice or uh, be, uh, proceedings of the EU institutions and bodies. As I was saying before, more powers means also more uh, protection. 
on the other side if, if we if we see the other side of the balance so the two major innovations that are in the regulation as i said are the, the establishment of the controller of procedural guarantees and the setting up of a new complaints mechanism um a few words about the controller who is that person what does he do what uh, what is the scope of the action and what is the impact uh, of the action of the controller on all of so uh, again, this is very theoretical because it has not happened yet in practice, but just a few words about, uh, about it. Uh, so the controller is an internal function uh, of control of OLAF's compliance with procedural guarantees. Uh, at the same time, the controller is a person who will be appointed by the commission. The procedure is very well explained in the regulation. Uh, You'll be happy to know maybe that the procedure is ongoing, so we would expect that the controller will be appointed soon. Uh, the role of the controller will be to monitor OLAF's compliance with procedural guarantees, fundamental rights, uh, and the rules applicable to investigations. So there is a whole set of rules uh, that the controller will be uh, able to verify the, the compliance with and how he or she will do this by handling complaints. Complaints against Olaf, uh, but the scope of these complaints would be quite limited, yes and no, because uh, there will be complaints submitted by persons concerned in Olaf investigations. Uh, at the same time, we, we can expect that uh, now that there is there are specific provisions in the regulation, we can is expect that there are a certain number of complaints we will see. Uh, but also this means that uh, complaints submitted by other persons like witnesses or informants will not be uh, within the scope or mandate of the controller. These complaints will be or will continue to be dealt with by OLAF. Uh, as I said, there, are, there is also a new complaints mechanism. Com complaints mechanism means, in fact, the procedure which will be applicable uh, to, to these complaints. Uh, but again, I will not uh, give too many details because uh, the procedure is quite well developed in the regulation. But in a nutshell, what the controller will be able to do if there is, um, let's hope not, but if there is uh, an instance of non-compliance with procedural guarantees or uh, rules applicable to investigations, the controller will be able to propose a solution to solve the complaint or to issue uh, a recommendation. Of course, this will happen following a, a, uh, an adversarial procedure. The controller will hear the person complaining, Olaf. Um, and uh, very important to, to say that Olaf uh, will continue to uh, conduct its investigation. A complaint will not have a suspensive uh, effect on the conduct of the investigation. Um, what is also important to, to know is that um, the controller may recommend, amongst others, we'll see, we'll see the, the list of possible solutions that the controller can propose is not exhaustive in the regulation, but the most important are there. So um, the controller may recommend to Olaf to amend or repeal its recommendations or reports. Uh, this means, for instance, if, uh, if an investigation is closed, and there is a complaint shortly after, meaning one at the latest one month after. And if there is a problem, and if the controller will uh, will recommend to the director general to uh, amend or repeal a recommendation or report, this will have serious consequences for us because we will probably need to reopen the investigation, to change some documents, to resend them to the uh, follow-up authorities, etc. Uh, but we'll see again in practice how, how this uh, will work. And of course, we are prepared for this, even if the controller has not uh, arrived yet. But we um, we um, have just modified our uh, guidelines on uh, uh, investigation procedures, and we ha we have introduced new rules for us to 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 help us uh, to guide us in in how to deal with requests and uh, recommendations made uh, by the controller. Um, of course, um, just to mention us examples without entering into details, additional procedural safeguards have been also introduced in the in Olaf in the revised Olaf regulation. Uh, maybe one of the most important is the fact that when Olaf will uh, conduct support, um, will uh, carry out support measures for the EPO, uh, Olaf will have to comply with the procedural guarantees which are set out in uh, Chapter 6 of the EPO regulation. 
Um, there are some additional procedural guarantees in the context on the, on the spot checks and inspections, a new provision on access to the final reports to our biolab, bio which will change a bit our practice because in practice, until now, we were refusing access to the final report. Uh, now, under specific conditions, which are set out in, uh, in the new Article 10 3 b we'll probably be obliged to give access to, to the final report, but really in, uh, under very, very strict conditions, uh, one of which will be, for instance, I will not mention them all, but one of which is to respect the uh, confidentiality rights of uh, uh, informants and whistleblowers. And I, I wanted to mention whistleblowers because one of the new provisions of, uh, of the regulation is also this reference to the protection of uh, uh, persons reporting serious breaches of, um, of um, uh, law. Uh, and it, it, there is a specific mention uh, or reference to the whistleblowing directive. For, it is very important because it's, it's, something, it's something new. And um, to go to the second part of my presentation, but again, I'll pass very quickly, how uh, the legislator has prepared Olaf to work together with the EPO by introducing new provisions, which are, uh, have been already mentioned uh, here. It's, uh, these are the provisions in Article 12C until 12G of the OLAF regulation. So these are, in fact, mirroring provisions. They, they, they mirror similar provisions in, in the EPO regulation. And they concern reporting a criminal conduct to, to, to the EPO, non-duplication of investigations, OLAF support to the EPO, complementary investigations, and OLAF EPO working arrangements. A few words about each of them. Uh, reporting criminal conduct to the EPO, we have already starting to do it. We do it via uh, what we call uh, EPO crime reports. So the content of the report is also indicated in the regulation. We are obliged to inform EPO without delay. What happens if this, um, if we if we inform uh, uh, during an OLAF investigation? supposing that we conduct an administrative investigation and in the course of the administrative investigation we discover a criminal element, so we report to, to the EPO and uh, we may discontinue our investigation because there is this principle of non-duplication of investigation, so if the EPO will conduct a criminal investigation into the same facts, we will probably discontinue our investigation unless we, we conduct support measures or unless we conduct a complementary investigation. Speaking of the principle of non-duplication of, of uh, investigations, and I, I hope to, re to reply to your question, what does it mean? In, it means exactly what I said before. If there is an ongoing investigation and we discover criminal elements, we will stop unless the EPO ask us to, to carry out support measures or unless we can complement all of uh, EPO investigation. Uh, if we discover this before uh, opening an investigation, of course, we will not open it. Uh, how do we check this? We check this ba uh, on the basis of uh, indirect uh, access to EPO's manage uh, case management system. It's a hit, no hit system. Basically, if there is a, a match between our case and Apple's case, we, in, in the framework of coordination, consultation, dialogue, we will, this, I mean, Apple and Olaf will decide what will be the course of action. Um, and, uh, but of course, uh, the, the information goes in both ways. Apple also will uh, inform Olaf when it decides not to conduct an investigation or to, to dismiss the case. Uh, it was also mentioned the, um, uh, the fact that Olaf will uh, support the EPO or will carry it out complementary investigation. So these are two different things. What does it mean? Support to the EPO will mean to provide the EPO with information, expertise, forensic analysis, operational support. It means also to coordinate the, the action of the national uh, administrative activities or to carry out investigations, but strictly in support to the EPO. Complementary investigations are something different. This is something which is, um, I mean, there will be independent investigations carried by Olaf within its mandate, 
but in close consultation with the EPO. And there are these provisions in Article 12F saying that OLAF shall consult the EPO and uh, the EPO may object to the opening of a complementary investigation or may object to the uh, performance of certain investigative acts. So you can see that there are rules very clear, I hope, I mean, in theory, they are clear, in practice, we'll see, which allow avoiding uh, that uh, we duplicate efforts and uh, spend resources uh, without uh, justification. And I would say, to this brings me to the end of my presentation, I, I would say that we are, quite, we, I hope, quite well prepared for this. Uh, the working arrangements have already been mentioned. They were signed in July, so we are already operating based on these uh, working uh, arrangements. We have uh, modified also our guidelines on investigation procedures, and I'm happy to announce you that they have been adopted this week and they will be entering into force as of next Monday, so it's something very new. And finally, uh, we have OLAF has also been reorganized very recently. Uh, and one of the features of the new reorganization is the fact that we have a new uh, unit which is dedicated to operation coordination with the, with the EPO. So uh, at least um, in, on paper we are prepared. Now in practice, challenges I'm sure that we will find, will, uh, uh, they will happen day by day, but we just need, as Ernesto said, to cooperate, discuss, consult each other, and to work uh, together. So, as, because this is all new for us, I would say that it is uh, the start of a new journey to get together. We'll see how this will uh, work in practice. And I think that the next, uh, if I can say like this, rendezvous, is the next uh, commission evaluation of the implementation of OLAF regulations. So maybe in a few years' time, we'll speak again about how uh, effective all these changes have been. Thank you very much for your attention. Grazie, Diana Spunti. Thanks, Diana. It's very interesting inputs keep on uh, flowing as much as uh, the working flow in progress aspect of the praxis that emerges in order to solve uh, the problems that arise. So this is complicated, but it's fascinating as we see how a new model of efficiency uh, comes to light when I've seen in the course of time that when you had good minds taking care of uh, all the organizational aspects, you have good results. We can then also convince the states that are more reluctant to somehow accept to transfer powers in terms of investigative powers. So... <laughs> Line. Uh, benissimo. Please, we're glad that you are online, so the floor is yours and we welcome you remotely. Unfortunately, from the podium, we cannot... Bene, adesso... Adesso finalmente lo vediamo. Okay, so we see you now and we are very happy to give you the floor for your presentation and I apologize for not having realized you were remotely connected. Uh, and so many greetings from Luxembourg, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear co-panelists, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to thank the... So my name is Jan Ingelram. I'm a director and legal advisor on administrative matters of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, and I would like to share some personal reflections, of the reflections are personal, not uh, those of the institution with you. And to start, I would like to thank the Fondazione Basso for having invited me and also to have uh, allowed me to do it online, which was uh, not possible otherwise. Uh, and then, uh, then to participate in this panel on the legal new legal framework resulting from Regulation 2020-2023, which I will call the 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 2020 regulation uh, further in my my expose 
Uh, as its title indicates, the 2020 regulation has a twofold objective. It is first organizing cooperation between OLAF uh, and the EPO, and secondly, enhancing the effectiveness of OLAF's investigations. Uh, to go over briefly these two uh, objectives, the first one, organizing cooperation between OLAF and the EPO, there are several many aspects to this cooperation already uh, the the for example non duplication of investigations uh, was mentioned uh, but i would like to deal with one specific one uh, namely procedural guarantees uh, considering that the fact the, considering the fact that the EPO may request olaf to conduct administrative investigations that's provided for that was already provided for in the EPO regulation and is provided also for uh, in, in the new amended OLAF regulation. Uh, the procedural guarantees applicable to OLAF and to the EPO should in principle be equivalent uh, when OLAF conducts investigations for the EPO. Uh, it's clear that the EPO cannot circumvent uh, the procedural guarantees applicable to it by, by asking OLAF to uh, conduct an investigation with uh, different uh, uh, safeguards applicable. So the 2020 regulation indeed explicitly mentions that where OLAF conducts investigations for the EPO, the EPO and OLAF acting in close cooperation shall ensure that the applicable procedural safeguards of Chapter 6 of the EPO regulation are observed. And this Chapter 6 now has two articles. It has Article 41 and Article 42. To say something about Article 41, uh, it states that any suspect or accused person in the criminal proceeding shall at the minimum have the procedural rights provided for in union law in uh, criminal proceedings of the EPO. And some, I quote some here, uh, the right to information uh, and access to the case materials, the right of access to a lawyer, the right to remain silent, and the right to be presumed innocent. Um, th these procedural rights all also exist with those which I've mentioned, uh, in the context of OLAF investigations, though there, so there's equivalency there. But there's one right which does not exist in the OLAF context. This is the right of access to the file. This has been constantly uh, also decided in court uh, cases. There's no, the right of access to, the fundamental right of access to the file does not apply to, to OLAF investigations. Uh, but uh, an equivalent right of access to the case materials, which is in fact an access right of access to the file, exists in the context of the EPO. Uh, since the EPO uh, procedural safeguards will apply, the right of access to the case materials should also apply when OLAF conducts administrative investigations for the EPO. So uh, perhaps it will be interesting to see whether this will lead to a first exception to the absence of a right of access to the file in the context of OLAF investigations. It's more a question which I submit than an answer that I give, but uh, it was a reflection which came up when I read this, uh, uh, this, this article on the application of EPO safeguards to OLAF uh, when it conducts uh, investigations for the EPO. The second one, Article 42, is on, on judicial review, and that's a very, very interesting and a very delicate article. Uh, uh, on judicial review, it provides that as a general rule, national courts have jurisdiction to review procedural acts of the EPO that are intended to produce legal effects vis-a-vis -vis. So the national courts are in principle competent. And then Article 42 also defines some specific issues on which the EU courts have jurisdiction. Um, uh, if you allow me a, a small excursus here from the subject matter of, of, of Olaf, strictly speaking, I think uh, also Luca Di Matteis this morning uh, gave already a very interesting overview of all the possible and impossible legal questions which can arise in the context of the EPO. I personally, I think that this Article 42 is also one because it's an ad hoc solution very clearly. Um, and so how now, when, wh who will be competent when is not, 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 uh, not always clear. And there is one provision which intrigues me here in the EPO regulation. Uh, it is Article 42, Paragraph 2, under C, which gives the ECJ jurisdiction under Article 267, that's the preliminary ruling procedure, uh, where a national court asks a question to the Court of Justice. Uh, concerning the interpretation uh, of Articles 22 and 25 of the EPO regulation in relation to any conflict of competence between the EPO and the competent national authorities. We discussed yesterday a lot about 
competence also Lorenzo Salazar uh, 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 mentioned the issue uh, but uh, I'm personally intrigued because the preliminary, preliminary ruling procedure under 267 is clearly a procedure where a national court asks a question of interpretation or validity uh, of European Union to the Court of Justice uh, where it needs this answer to adjudicate a case so, and this is an instrument of cooperation between Court of Justice and National Court. So, uh, unless something is escaping me, uh, the, the, the mere question uh, or, or a conflict of competence between a National Court and the EPO, I don't see how it can be just sent under 267 to the Court of Justice. But okay, uh, the provision is there, so uh, let's have ourselves surprised by if ever the... the the, the 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 issue is there how it will be solved now to come back to my uh, to, to to article 42 on judicial review uh, so epo national courts are in principle competent and now with what with olaf uh, the situation is very different or is different for olaf because olaf is a part of the european commission uh, its acts so reports and so on are acts of an eu institution and national courts do not have jurisdiction to declare acts of an EU institution invalid. Only EU courts can do so. That's constant case law. I'm not going into details here. It is true that national courts have jurisdiction to judge on the admissibility of OLAF reports as evidence in national procedures. But this is still something entirely different from reviewing the legality of that report under EU law, which is a matter uh, for the EU, EU courts only. And if the national court has a doubt on the validity of that report, it should send a question to the Court of Justice. This was also in the TILAC case already confirmed by the general court. So there's a, a fundamental difference between the EPO and OLAF as regards the courts having jurisdiction to review their acts. And this difference goes back to primary EU law. So uh, for me personally, it's not immediately clear exactly how the provisions on judicial review applicable to the EPO uh, can apply or will apply or can apply to OLAF investigations conducted for the EPO. So it's an open question for me, but every question can find an answer in the future. But I think uh, this is a, a, an important issue uh, going back to primary EU law uh, and we have to see. So Olaf conducting administrative investigations for the EPO will, I think, undoubtedly give rise to uh, a series of interesting uh, legal questions. Briefly, on the second objective of the 2020 regulation, uh, which is enhancing the effectiveness of Olaf's investigations, there were several changes and many have already been discussed by speakers before me. Uh, I, 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 for me personally, there are four major changes or sets of changes which are, uh, which I, I, I um, deduced from from the new regulation, 2020 regulation. The first is a change in relation to the applicable law to all of its investigations. Two, the second is strengthening some of Olaf investigative powers. Three is also a change in the position of Olaf towards the Commission. I don't think this has been discussed yet. I'll come to it. And four is the establishment of the controller of procedural guarantees. First, uh, the change in relation to the applicable uh, uh, laws. This has already been uh, mentioned uh, by Mrs. Kinichi. Uh, there are two elements there, uh, and also by Mrs. Rioche. Uh, so the legal framework has been simplified, and I think this is very important. Uh, this is not only um, this not only in, in, uh, enhances the efficiency of Olaf, but it also gives legal certainty to all parties involved. So it's not just Olaf benefiting from this simplification of legal framework. It is all parties involved. So first, when uh, on the spot checks and inspections and the economic operator does not oppose, then only EU law applies. Uh, as Ms. Rioche mentioned, this was um, already decided in the General Court's judgment of the 3rd of May 2018 in case Sigma Orionis versus Commission. So, in fact, it was already the law under the, the 
2013 regulation, but I mean, it's always better to uh, put it uh, clear uh, in the regulation itself uh, that that is the, the law. So question of legal certainty also. And then also duplication of applicable laws is no longer there uh when the report is used elsewhere than in criminal proceedings uh then uh, the rules applicable to administ national administrative inspectors do no longer apply so that's also uh, i think an, an important clarification that is new uh, compared to uh, the other one which is is in fact called a consolidation of case law uh, a second change or set of changes uh, is uh, strengthening or at least clarification of Olaf's investigative powers. I think should be mentioned here uh, is the duty on economic operators to cooperate with Olaf and to provide information, which is now explicitly in the regulation, which already existed for uh, in the context of internal investigations for EU staff. But it's new, at least explicitly, uh, in the context of external investigations for economic operators, and as far as I can read. However, uh, I think it's always important to, to remind that the practical effect of such a duty of information is limited to the extent that uh, the right not to incriminate oneself comes looking behind the corner and that it must always be balanced against that right. So... It, it is always more, I have always thought it is more or less, uh, more or less relative duty. Uh, can be, I mean, theoretically is important, but in practice, uh, it, it, it can be relative. And then uh, the privately owned devices, also mentioned by Mr. Rio. Uh, I, I, I st started by saying um, uh, the new or, or clarif new uh, power or clarification. Uh, I think it's it's interesting to see that Olaf already considered that it could inspect privately owned devices because also it had adopted internal rules on the way in which an inspection of privately owned devices uh, could be done. Uh, that is the 2016 internal rules on digital forensic operations already mentions in Article 5 the way in which Olaf uh, could inspect. So it's, it's not a real new power. Uh, what is new is that it's now in the, the, the OLAF regulation uh, explicitly mentioned. It's interesting to see also that it was not in the Commission's proposal, so it is somewhere in the, in the legislative process it has been introduced. Uh, it's also interesting to see that uh, for internal investigations, uh, the, the, each institution has to define the conditions for such an examination of privately owned devices. And I don't think I tell a secret that all currently all institutions are struggling with uh, such a decision. Um, it's, on the other hand, an, an important, I think, important for the efficiency of the investigations of Olaf, because uh, let us not forget that many, I mean, the, it allows Olaf to inspect privately owned devices, for example, in a bring your own device program, BYOD. And uh, certainly with uh, also COVID and so on and so on, uh, I mean, push mails are often on the private uh, smartphones of, of, of people working for a company or for, for the institutions. The, the Court of Justice also has the bring your own device um, uh, program for uh, push mails. On, on, uh, uh, so uh, this allows, I mean, this gives certainty on the, the possibility for Olaf to investigate uh, these privately owned devices, which are, of course, as already mentioned also by Madame Miss Rioche, it's quite delicate because you're very close, you're interfering with the private, the fundamental right to respect for private and family life enshrined in Article 7 of the Charter. Uh, what I would like to add also here is that talking about the judgment I already mentioned in my intervention uh, this morning of the 30th of September, uh, 2021, so uh, eight days ago, nine days ago, uh, a court of auditors against a former member of the court of auditors to, on serious misconduct. Uh, I read with much interest uh, the paragraphs 162 to 166, where the court uh, clearly states uh, that the fact that information is of a private nature is not enough to, is not as such an obstacle to Olaf's investigative powers. Uh, so it's not because uh, something has private or even uh, it's a private device that for that reason it's automatically contra in violation of the fundamental right to private to respect for private and family life and that therefore 
Olaf would perhaps no, not have a competence uh, power investigation. So that is not the case. This is explicitly, you can read explicitly or deduce it from the paragraphs 162 to 166 of the, the judgment of the 30th of September. Um, yeah, the bank account uh, information has already been mentioned also. So I've just, uh, it, it's not new. I, I mean, if you read the, 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 the the, the preamble of the regulation, it's clear that already, Olaf already had information in a number of member states, but it's important now that it has been uh, throughout the Union that there's a common approach uh, throughout the European Union. And I think it's one of the most visible changes, uh, most visible and striking changes to the 2020 regulation. Uh, if one talks about bank account information, it's always everybody's looking up automatically. The third change relates to the position of Olaf towards the European Commission, to which it structurally belongs. Olaf has always been independent from the European Commission in relation to its investig investigation activities, that already since 1999. Uh, but the 2020 regulation has extended this uh, to coordination activities, uh, which, of course, is also uh, this independency, extended independency, undoubtedly strengthens Olaf's position towards the European Commission and towards the member states, but it's, I think, personally, it raises a question of an institutional nature. Uh, because Article 325, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the Europe European Union, there is a reference to the, 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 the coordination task. It imposes on the, me the member states the obligation to coordinate their anti-fraud activities uh, together with the Commission. The Commission is explicitly mentioned in the, uh, there in the, the treaty. So an interesting question is whether this treaty article allows the European Commission to pass on this coordination task conferred upon it directly by the treaty to OLAF, which is an independent uh, office to which the, the, the Commission cannot, leave, uh, cannot uh, give instructions. So this is... Uh, an, um, a question of 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 of, of delegation. Uh, interesting. Uh, it's quite institutional. I don't know what the practical effect is, but it could uh, be an interesting uh, institutional uh, discussion on delegation. Now, the fourth and last change I would like to mention, coming towards the end of my intervention, is the establishment of a controller of procedure guarantees. Already also discussed uh, before me. And it may be paradoxical to consider this as a strengthening of Olaf's position. Uh, but <coughs> as the Olaf Supervisory Committee pointed out in its 2020 activity report, uh, this new function could further reinforce public trust in Olaf's fraud prevention mission and tasks. Uh, so therefore, it's also kind of strengthening of its uh, legitimacy. But the establishment of the controller is not just a matter of enhancing uh, Olaf's legitimacy. Uh, I'm personally convinced it is also a response to a legal requirement resulting from the need to respect fundamental rights. Uh, because for interference with fundamental rights to be justified, case law of the European Court of Human Rights, but also of the EU courts, underline the need for adequate protection by the applicable legislation against arbitrary measures. So this protection implies that access to an independent authority must be guaranteed, which can control the interference with fundamental rights. This is an extremely uh, very important. So you don't have just to respect the fundamental rights. You have to create the, the framework of such a respect. And their independent control is extremely necessary, is, is extremely important. And this is precisely the kind of control which a controller is called upon to exercise. He, is in the, he or she is independent, including from Olaf, and he or she will examine complaints regarding Olaf's compliance with procedural guarantees and fundamental rights. Now, it's true that this intervention is not legally binding upon Olaf, uh, because the competence of the controller is limited to giving recommendations to the Director General of Olaf. However, if the director general does, decides not to follow uh, the recommendation, he or she must communicate to the complainant and to the controller the main reasons for that decision. Uh, this transparency is a way of protecting a person against arbitrary measures, which is the ultimate goal of independent control of interference with fundamental rights. Uh, a further limitation I would like to mention is that the, 
controller can only intervene if if a complaint uh, is lodged or if the director general of OLAF requests the controller for an opinion. The controller cannot intervene on his or her own initiative. However, the complaint mechanism is in reality only effective insofar as the person concerned is aware of a possible violation of his or her procedural guarantees and or fundamental rights. This is often not the case in situations which have an important impact on those guarantees, namely when Olaf decides not to inform a person of an investigation. How can somebody who is not informed of an investigation can file a complaint or decide to defer the right to be heard? Precisely in situations where control would be necessary, it could not be exercised unless the director general takes the initiative of requesting the opinion of the controller. And there I would like to refer to the 2020 regulation, the fact that it explicitly mentions the decision to defer informing the person concerned as a reason for requesting the opinion of the controller by the director general, I, I think it can be seen as an invitation to the director general to precisely do so in a situation where the person concerned is not able to file a complaint because he doesn't know it. So uh, I think this this it's not just the, the possibility of asking uh, an opinion is not just uh, some faculty for the director general. It may be there necessarily to, uh, to uh, I mean, in such certain situations where a complaint is not possible because the person doesn't know it. Uh, to conclude this brief overview, the 2020 regulation has made Olaf ready to cooperate with the Apple. It has strengthened Olaf's powers to the benefit of its own investigations, but also when Olaf conducts investigations for the Apple to the benefit of the Apple. And it has increased Olaf's legitimacy by establishing an independent control of Olaf's compliance with procedural guarantees and fundamental rights. I think Olaf is clearly fit for the future and to, in order to be an efficient connector, as Ernesto Bianchi uh, said so illustratively yesterday. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ingram, for this wonderful presentation, which uh, covers another aspect, the guarantee of fundamental rights, which at the end of the day, it's a, a guarantee to the right of the, of the right to, for the defense and internally, the legitimacy of institutions depend on the level of guarantees that they comply with the level of uh, compliance with uh, privacy and the rights of the person, uh, uh, comply with the rights of the persons. Uh, I think this is of great interest. The legitimacy depends on the level of accountability in the independence and the compliance with the rights of people who are subject to the investigation. So this is the most important principle, and we're very grateful to you for this approach in your presentation. That being said, are there any questions that you wish to ask of the various speakers? Uh, uh, well, Mrs. Kinichi has got to leave us, so we thank her very much for being with us this afternoon, but she has to go and catch a flight. My name is Hans Holger Hanford. I used to work for the German Ministry of Justice, and now I'm an interested pensioner living in Austria. I have one question, uh, actually, and one comment to what Mr. Ingelram said, which I could also turn into a question to Diana. My first question is, um, you pointed out that the procedure uh, for cooperation between Olaf and the EPO is different from the traditional procedure in relation between Olaf and the national judicial authorities. The idea now clearly being that uh, the Olaf should inform the EPO without undue delay about any cases where, that could, where there could be a criminal offense involved. My uh, question is, what does that mean in practice? I mean, uh, when, when you look at, uh, at uh, Olaf cases, can you see that when there's a smuggling event concerning Hungary, that Olaf would continue for longer periods of administrative investigations and then finally coming up with the usual recommendation. Uh, whereas if the same thing would happen in Austria, you would 
quickly inform the EPO and not continue administrative investigations for the time being. Can you say that that is really the difference and where's the, th the threshold? Because the EPO regulation also says that Olaf may undertake preliminary evaluations of the allegations. So you need to draw the line somewhere of what is undue delay. In that context, another question uh, to you, how do you deal with situations where you actually have a concurrent competence of a participating member, uh, sorry, of a non-participating member state in the EPO. I think uh, uh, Nicholas mentioned this morning investigations undertaken by Olaf uh, at, at Frontex. I don't want to know anything about the details, but Frontex, of course, is in Poland in a non-participating member state. So you would at some point pr presumably undertake administrative investigations and then maybe come up with a judicial recommendation to Poland. However, let's assume that the suspect, the main suspect, is a German citizen. Then also the EPO has a competence uh, because uh, Germany has a competence for German citizens and the EPO can undertake investigations also for national citizens of participating member states even, they, even if they committed a crime in a non-participating member states. So how do you deal with those situations where you have two conflicting rules applicable of when to inform the competent authorities? Uh, secondly, uh, a remark to what Mr. Ingram said, but in a way it is also uh, leading perhaps to a question to you. Uh, Mr. Ingram said that um, you, you alerted to the fact that when the EPO, sorry, when Olaf uh, conducts administrative investigations, how that re, uh, um, how do you then apply Article 42, Paragraph 1, and the competence of the national courts? I mean, when we negotiated the EPO regulation, uh, we specifically wrote into Article 101 that Olaf may conduct administrative investigations in a way that is obvious because Olaf can only do administrative investigations. But it was also worded that way to clarify that, the, that Olaf was not supposed to be a police judiciaire for the EPO. So not in charge of undertaking criminal investigations for the EPO. Uh, I think it would have been preferable when Olaf regulation was revised to clarify what that actually means, that Olaf can undertake administrative investigations on request of the EPO. When we did the EPO regulation, we simply referred to that, but it would have been preferable, I think, to clarify what it actually means, what kind of administrative investigations can Olaf actually take on request of the EPO. We heard about the possibility to complement investigations by going after the money. But in that case, Olaf actually undertakes an own, uh, an, an own uh, competence of going after the money, and it is not a procedural act of the EPO, uh, which Olaf does by going after the money. And personally, I don't believe there are administrative investigations that Olaf can undertake on request of the EPO, which would then be considered a procedural act of the EPO. So therefore, I think the issue that Mr. Engelram raised is an interesting question, but I don't think it should happen in practice because there should not be such administrative uh, activities or actions of Olaf which would qualify as a procedural act of the EPO. Thank you. Grazie. Vedremo poi we'll see. I think I can say a couple of words and then I'll give the floor to the experts. I feel that uh, we will have to look into the kind of agreement that will be entered into Dubai, uh, Olaf and EPPO, according to the article in the regulation. I think that this is the heart of the matter. Without a clear-cut definition and boundary lines between who does what, uh, there is a definite uh, risk of uh, duplication, and hopefully there is no risk of entering into a conflict. Let's see what Diana has to say on that. Interesting questions. I, I hope to have the answer to all, but I'm not pretty sure because, of course, this um, this is very new for us. So uh, these are issues that will surely come in practice. Uh, so we'll ha we'll have to solve them when they will come, and uh, we will have to interpret the rules uh, in such a way as to to make things working. So. Uh, 
I, I hope I'll, I will have a theoretical answer, but I, I, I really would like to see also how this will happen in practice. So with regard to your, your, for, your first question, exactly. so cooperation, uh, Olaf, EPO, uh, in different member states and how Olaf would inform EPO. Um, so I, what I know is that now, for instance, when we have... Um, uh, cases where we, we may have two different member states, let's say the example you gave Hungary, Austria, and we discovered that there is a criminal element, uh, we just froze our cases. We froze them until we uh, discussed the, the cases with the EPO and we agree who does what and how we split the work, if we transfer the whole case to the EPO, if we uh, take a part or... Uh, uh, we just discontinued the investigation. So this this is solved, I would say, on a practical basis, on a case-by-case -case basis, depending really on the concrete uh, circumstances. So we, we just don't continue blindly. We stop. We stop, we discuss, and we take a decision. Um, then about the, the second question... You mentioned the, the, the example of Frontex. So Frontex, Frontex, of course, this is an internal investigation, uh, which means that, uh, um, of course, we first of all, what can Olaf recommend? It can recommend uh, disciplinary action. It can recommend, uh, I, I mean, I don't know absolutely nothing about this case, so I, I, I don't know what Olaf, Olaf could recommend in such a case, but theoretically, so disciplinary action... Uh, uh, or um, let's say if, if there is a judicial recommendation, what happens? Okay, Poland is not a participating member state, so the judicial recommendation goes to Poland Polish authorities. So EPO theoretically will not be involved in that part. But if, as you said, if there is a German national, again, I think that... Uh, this will be decided on a case-by-case -case basis, discussing between Olaf and EPO. So uh, everything will depend on really the concrete circumstances. So I'm, I'm not sure that I will have a, uh, an answer to, to, this, uh, to this case because you have already, I think we have already discussed that uh, it's, for me it's like a puzzle. We have to see which part is EPO, which part is Olaf, which part is... Uh, we can do in common, which part we can separate, uh, which can, uh, how can we support EPO? Of course, Ep uh, Olaf is not the judiciary police uh, for the EPO, but what, what, what I can give you as an example, so this you, I will not reveal a secret because in any case it will be published on our website, so you'll see in our new guidelines on investigation procedure, we make a clear distinction between what is support to the EPO and what is um, investigation in support to the EPO? It's very, I think it's a bit abstract now. Practice will, sh will show if uh, the concepts are pretty, uh, are, are quite clear, but to, to make the distinction, support measure. So this would be Article 12E, I think, from the OLAF regulation. Support measure is something that OLAF will do for the EPO without using investigative powers, meaning, uh, providing analysis, forensic uh, information, uh, but that's it, not investigation. So we will open a case, we'll do something for the EPO, but we'll not use investigative powers. There is also the concept of investigations in support to the EPO. This is new for, uh, for, for us uh, as well. So again, I think I've said it several times, we'll see how it will work in practice. But this will mean an investigation in which Olaf opens, I mean, an investigation open based on Article 5 of, of our regulation, uh, but with a specific purpose of doing something for the EPO, like uh, going to do on, uh, an on-the-spot check uh, so the result of this specific investigative measure will be also, uh, how to say, uh, concrete, concrete is, no, uh, will be reflected, let's say, uh, I missed the, the, the correct English word, will be reflected in a final report which will be sent to the EPO because it's something that we will do for the EPO. 
so the, on one hand, we have support measures, non-investigative powers, investigations in support to the EPO, but specifically for the EPO. And these two categories are, of course, different from uh, complementary investigations, which are investigations that we open to complement EPO's activity. They will do criminal investigation. We do administrative investigations to, that will, will uh, lead to the adoption of precautionary measures or disciplinary or uh, recommendations or financial recommendations. So, of course, there is theoretically also a risk of overlapping, but I think the, the master word, the key word of, uh, of the whole conference was uh, cooperation, cooperation, dialogue, consultation. So this, I hope, will uh, allow solving the practical problems. We'll see. Thank you. May, may I add something? Grazie, to... sì, vediamo cosa ha... Yes, let's also see what Mr. Jan Ingram has to say. Can you hear me? Missing... You can hear me? Sì, sì, perfettamente. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is a, a very interesting question on the possibility. Uh, it has always intrigued me, this possibility uh, to, for Olaf uh, to, to conduct investigations for the EPO. Uh, because the last, uh, so the remark which, which was made in a remark or question, should such investigations take place? I think it's, it's a very practical question, because if you look, for example, you take uh, a suspected corruption in a EU institution, uh, the, the EPO picks it up, uh, but you need to know what happened, so you have to do a search in the institution. The EPO will need a judicial authorization, to do such a search. Uh, I mean, I'm not a criminal lawyer expert, but I suppose that's the case. Uh, such a, a search done by national authorities um, on behalf of the EPO, the EPO they will have the pro protocol on, on uh, privileges and immunities. You may have to have to lift the uh, immunities and so on and so on. So this is quite uh, difficult. Whereas Olaf just kicks in uh, with the mandate um, Nothing more than that. The director general gives a mandate, opens the investigation, gives a mandate. Uh, so the difference, uh, I mean, I think the temptation will be enormous uh, if it is about investigations in the institutions. I don't talk about external investigations because there might perhaps be different. But in the investigations, internal investigations, the temptation might be enormous to ask Olaf to do the investigation because there the the, the framework is, is extremely light, uh, also procedural guarantees. Therefore, I'm very happy that there's control there because then that's still it's well, the, the, the level of the standard is lifted up for all of investigations. But I mean, uh, I don't know whether this, uh, I, I think there is this temptation there. I mean, I don't know whether Olaf would contradict it. Uh, or hasn't thought about it, I don't know. But um, I, I see this as a risk uh, so that it, uh, Olaf is used because it is uh, very easy to, to, to do an investigation and then, but that would be, amount to more or less circumventing uh, uh, obligations applicable to the Apple or could amount to that. So, um, voilà, thank you. But yeah, I leave it uh, open. I mean, it's not. Uh, uh. Gra grazie, mi pare di capire. Thank you. Following what you said, it seems that this is the moment to raise questions. The more questions we raise, the better. And then we will see what answers will come about. And this is a good approach to have good results. Questions are essential. Thank you very much, Professor Wachmeyer from Spain. Um, just entering into the discussion because I think it's a very crucial one as regards the powers of Olaf in, in these investigations for the European public prosecutor, which uh, uh, if the aim was not to make uh, Olaf as an agency like uh, Police Judiciaire for the EPO, so this is a period apparently in contradiction with that. Secondly, uh, um, with regard to the words that we just heard about this um, on the 
most easy way to get into search of premises and and seize documents under the OLAF administrative regulations and then possibly use them for the EPO uh, proceedings, I think this is absolutely against the principles of uh, criminal evidence and admissibility of evidence because it's just circumventing the safeguards of collecting evidence by just using an open door in these investigations for the Apple. At least to my mind, to my mind, uh, when there are measures in, which entail interference in human rights, in fundamental rights, like searches and, and seizure of documents and so forth, the privacy, I would say that would lead to inadmissible evidence in, in a criminal procedure, if not any other infringement, which would entail for law enforcement, and I think uh, um, Olaf would be overstepping its mandate, even if it's provided like in the new regulation. I don't know. Thank you. And thank you for raising the question, Han Holger. Sì, sì, pare di capire che a seguire una, un completamento. So you want to say something else? You want to add something? To uh, Orena's uh, remarks. Uh, and, and to what, what, what you just said, if, if you have a situation where, for example, Hungary and Austria is connected to um, um, potential criminal activity when when you detect criminal activity your mandate ends and you you freeze the cases that's fine and you consult eppo concerning austria that's fine but then you should also consult hungary because that's hungarian criminal jurisdiction and that's that's outside of of eppo uh, field but it's outside of of olaf's uh, mandate so criminal activity belongs to those authorities who have a license to deal with criminal activities. That's one point. Another point is that uh, I don't think that a sane prosecutor would opt for an administrative investigation and an on-spot check instead of a criminal procedure measure like a house search and seizure according to the criminal procedure rules so I can't really can imagine any, any, I mean, at all, a situation where an administrative procedure could take precedent over criminal procedure measures. So this uh, second option of, uh, I'm very much convinced about the, the supportive steps, non-investigative steps taken by Olaf in support to, to uh, EPPO or other member states' uh, procedures. That's fine. But I can't imagine any situation where additional procedural steps could be more favorable from the point of view of a criminal procedure and admissibility of evidence than those which can be taken by those law enforcement agencies which have the mandate to investigate in criminal procedure. So this is just my, my opinion. Thank you. Grazie. Mi pare di capire. Thank you. If I am getting it right, it seems to me, and I'm intrigued by this problem because it is a problem of the applicability to domestic law and in the Italian case uh, they this would lead to a principle of uh, the illegality of uh, the evidence uh, which would have a huge impact on criminal proceedings. It seems to me what, that what you're saying is vis-a-vis uh, -vis an offence, uh, uh, the administrative phase must be suspended and all the work to uh, collect the evidence should be the exclusive competence of EPO. I have no uh, doubt on this, but I think w this could uh, be matched with the role of Olaf different to the phase of collecting the 
evidence or of confiscating uh, records and it is the competent prosecutor to say it in the Italian way that needs to have uh, to do this. But something different is to imagine that Olaf already has a set of documents uh, available and I don't see the harm of transferring uh, the, if there would be a, a, a harm in the transfer of such documents to the PPO. I hope I understood correctly. I would also kindly ask to our colleague Andrea Venegoni to come to the podium as uh, he will be drawing the conclusions of the conference. I see he was sitting just on a, uh, on a chair rather uncomfortably, so I think he can come to the podium. Uh, passing the word to, to Andrea. Um, I, I am trying to address both the comments from Lorena and Balash, uh, with, with which I fully agree. I, I, I was also, I can sell, say as a personal reflection that uh, when I first read the regulation, I was quite puzzled by, by some of the provisions, starting with uh, this uh, new Article 12E, uh, which is about support to the EPO. Uh, of course, again, We'll see how it will work in practice, but when we look at the theoretical aspect, for me, it's uh, there is also the counterpart. Okay, Olaf can conduct support. I mean, can provide support to the EPO, including by conducting investigations. But the, there is a limitation to this, and this limitation is very clear in this article. Olaf will have to comply with the procedural guarantees which are set out. Uh, uh, in Chapter 6 of the EPO regulation. So Olaf will be obliged to respect those rules. So in principle, uh, if all the rules are respected, uh, the measures carried out by Olaf and uh, which are will be reflected in, uh, in, in documents like final reports or, or another type of documents that? will be... Sorry? So this will, this will be... Um, okay, there was a bit of an echo effect because of the headsets. This should be resolved now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, not using the headset anymore. Uh, so uh, I was saying in principle, if these rules are uh, respected, so the procedural safeguards in, uh, of the EPO regulation, in principle, this should uh, Olaf report should be admissible. Again, we'll see the, the practice uh, will uh, will show us. And I, I will just refer to the fact that this article, if I remember well, I don't have the text in front of my eyes, but I think there are three categories of what means support to the EPO. The first is providing information, uh, analysis, uh, expert uh, analysis of something like this. The second point uh, was, if I remember well, uh, to provide, um, to coordinate uh, um, activities of uh, national uh, administrative authorities. So this would be the kind of support measures which do not require uh, investigative powers. And these are embedded in our guidelines under this category, new category, which is support cases. And the third point, I think it's point C of uh, this article, is uh, the power to conduct investigations in support to the EPO. So this is, I think, the category which is uh, most, let's say, problematic. But again, uh, the same procedural safeguards would apply. So I would imagine that if uh, Olaf investigation is conducted in compliance with these procedural safeguards, it's uh, everything should be fine, but we'll see. Um, and just uh, a last comment about uh, this... Uh, um, what you said, the, the example of Hungary, uh, Austria, again, um, of course, uh, the, the, the limitation is there in the regulation. Olaf uh, cannot do criminal, cannot conduct a criminal investigation. So if there is a criminal element, it sends it to the EPO. If EPO is not competent because the case, I mean, there is something linked to a, non -part a member state which does not participate in the EPO, Olaf has uh, another means, and this means is to do judicial recommendations. So, of course, Olaf will set up uh, it, uh, will, will will set up its findings in the final report, 
and will recommend a judicial follow-up, but not more. And this is what we have done until now for years. Yeah. So I think, of course, that there is always a balance to be found. And uh, in practice, uh, I think the difficulty would be exactly to know what to do. Split the case, send everything to the airport, send parts in different, to different uh, judicial authorities. We'll see. Thank you. Yeah. Grazie. Thank you. If there are no other questions. Thanks a lot. Actually, Ingrid Marshall Clausen, European prosecutor coming from Austria, as Austria has mentioned, has been mentioned a couple of times. Now, I think what will happen in practice, coming to Hans Holger's example, is that um, as soon as Olaf has any suspicion that um, a, a criminal offence affecting the EU's budget uh, has been committed, Olaf will inform the EPPO. And I can confirm that in each single case, when the, where there has been uh, an OLAF information to the EPPO, there has been the offer from the OLAF side uh, to discuss the case sort of bilaterally, in depth, the EDP in charge with the OLAF investigators to see what fits best for the individual case. Now, coming back to um, Hans Holger's example, actually, uh, the EPO will, as we know, will have to initiate a criminal investigation immediately. And at some point, if, if the suspicion uh, gets clearer and uh, is more reinforced, uh, the EPO will have to uh, conduct house searches within Frontex, meaning, as obviously Poland um, is not part of the EPO, um, or not a participating member state in the EPO, uh, the, um, um, you said it, it is a German citizen, actually it would, we would have a German handling EDP. The German handling EDP would send uh, a European investigation order to uh, Poland. And then the Polish authorities hopefully would uh, execute the house search. And then we are in the situation where we are already now uh, in, in uh, cross-border uh, contacts between EU member states. Either the Polish authorities, uh, on the basis of the results of the house searches by their own accord, start initiating an investigation, which would be a criminal investigation then, then Olaf can support. Or if not, the German EDP would, um, I guess, do what I have done when I was uh, uh, a prosecutor in Austria. Notably, um, send the material officially if the Polish authorities do not analyze uh, the seized material and send it back. I would send the analyzed material to the Polish authorities and I assume that's what the German EDP will do with the request to consider whether they have, in accordance with the Polish legislation, to initiate domestic proceedings. Now, there you go. So I don't think that actually, in, in reality, we would end up with uh, all of continuing administrative investigations without the Polish judicial authorities knowing all of that. I don't think that this is going to happen. And... Um, a small remark from my former professional life as national member for Eurojust. Actually, I, um, on behalf of the, the Austrian judicial authorities at the time, uh, had to um, coordinate um, in an um, investigate, investigation uh, against a former member of the European Parliament who... <laughs> Was, had to, was forced by his political party to step down from his mandate. 
I had to coordinate house searches um, in the premises of the European Parliament in Brussels and in, um, in, in Strasbourg. And upon request by, at that time, my um, national prosecutor in charge of the case, we managed to get Olaf um, into the team conducting the house search in, in the premises because um, my national prosecutor said, I don't know anything about the server of the European Parliament, Olaf will know. I don't know anything about the setup of the offices in the European Parliament, Olaf will know. So I can very well imagine that this type of support by Olaf is valuable and will be applied in practice also by EPO investigations and in EPO investigations. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think you have made the very relevant uh, comments, uh, very consistent uh, with the provisions contained in Article 12, quarter, para 1 and 2 of the new regulation. Not only do they refer to the need to, uh, with undue delay on the part of Olaf, to report about uh, possible uh, criminal uh, relevance, well, it has to sort of uh, uh, also provide all the available information as to the possible victims, uh, the suspects, uh, and the other. The uh, so I don't think that uh, it refers to just uh, a limited role, but the role of, of an authority that has its own know-how, that uh, provides information about uh, uh, an offence or a crime, which is as detailed as possible, uh, which is clearly an indication of the relation, a very clear collaboration, which is being uh, indicated in the new part of the regulation. So this brings us back to Article 12 of that that will indeed provide for a very precise agreement between EPO and Olaf. If there are no further questions, uh, I'll give the floor to my colleague, Andrea Venigoni, who'll draw this uh, meeting to a close and he'll draw conclusions in his capacity of former member of Olaf. And if, if ever he will become the general prosecutor of my office at the Court of Cassation, he will be responsible for dealing with APO problems at the level of the Cassation Court. And we cannot talk about that right now. Thank you. Let's keep our fingers crossed. So when that won't happen, I won't have to do that. Well, the beginning of this uh, sort of uh, final comments um, to wrap up this meeting. We'll start with words of thanks uh, for the Fondazione de Basso that has once again managed to organize a very relevant conference on this topic. The only comment uh, which I'd like to add on that, that even though the topic is of great interest, we don't manage to get a sort of a large audience also because of the pandemic in this case. Uh, however, we do have uh, the impression that we sort of have an, our own uh, private dialogue uh, on these matters. Uh, the, in the meeting that we've had five years ago or three years ago, uh, we were more or less uh, meeting with the same people here. And that is... Uh, uh, rather discouraging because uh, if I could uh, give in a nutshell what was uh, said on this uh, theme, the word that uh, came to mind uh, for me is uh, the liveliness of this uh, debate. So we have been uh, shown that this area of the law which uh, where criminal law in 
EU law uh, are intertwined. And we could also talk in terms of European EU uh, criminal law, um, if you like. It's one of the liveliest areas of both uh, criminal law, penal law, and the EU law. So it should be uh, very attractive and attract uh, lawyers and uh, magistrates and young scholars. In addition to that, uh, we have seen uh, the greatest uh, sort of uh, breakthrough with the establishment of EPPO that, as uh, the Chief Prosecutor Cavesi told us, is unprecedented, never existed any such a body. It's not a new coordination body established within the European Union, but it, it is a body that is uh, entrusted with the conduct of specific uh, criminal investigations in an area which comprises 22 countries that are member countries of the APA and which are combined in a single office. Uh, we cannot uh, talk in terms of a uh, single uh, legal area, but there is a single office which is in charge. Uh, another point of great interest, which was also emphasized by the deputy chair of the Higher Council for the Judiciary, is that the beginning of work done by uh, work undertaken by EPO uh, coincides with a very special time when uh, many European countries, Italy amongst them, are being granted um, considerable amount of funding from the European Union, which are part of the financial interest of the European Union, even though they are not part of the budget of the EU, strict to say so, but uh, can be covered by the general notion of financial interest of the EU. So EPO is uh, up and running and can uh, get down to sort of dealing with possible frauds in the use of this funding, so which come within the remit of EPPL. A further reason that we have to get to a great uh, get to know better what EPO is doing was emphasized by President Ippolito. We could say that EPO, EPPO, does um, represent the more sort of uh, unionist approach in the European Union. We know that there are two approaches, the intergovernmental approach and the unionist approach. The establishment of EPPO, which has not uh, been established uh, fully according to the proposal put forward by the European Commission is certainly a step forward in the path towards integration. So I'm sorry that we haven't had a large audience uh, listening to this debate in this area, which is of fundamental importance, the protection of uh, financial interest, as Mrs. Kenichi told us, uh, it's a testing ground for the creation of a common area of justice, uh, even criminal justice within the EU. And this is a process which is not starting today. Well, today we have EPPO and people seem to discover that it exists now, but we're talking in terms of an institution which is basically being preceded by work and discussions of which have been held for 20 years, if not more. Uh, so this area that covers the financial interest of the union is the number one sector in terms of creating the creation of a, an area of criminal justice uh, in Europe, uh, if we'll achieve that, uh, this will uh, be achieved uh, quite definitely in this area. We have talked about the various categories of frauds. Uh, um, Mrs. Holmeyer told us that frauds can be very complex and sophisticated, uh, which uh, demand a specific knowledge to be evaluated and which concern a specific area, European area. 
the many interests uh, which are covered by the Union. There is a typically supranational and European interest, as Fabio Giofrida said, is certainly represented by the financial interests of the Union. We have understood, and this was mentioned by Mr. Bianchi from Olaf, fraudsters in this area have become more and more sophisticated, and this demands a more uh, specific and uh, comprehensive answer on the part of the fiscal police. Uh, we've had uh, General Cuneo from the Guardia di Finanza, the fiscal police we have in Italy, uh, who explained how they're getting ready for it. This type of frauds require human and technical resources, which should be appropriate and sufficient. We've learned from the comments given by the Dr. Lashuk from the Court of Auditors that we have to further fine tune the communication mechanism. We've heard people talk about the relationship between EPPO, Olaf, and the Court of Auditors, the European Court of Auditors. So we have to um, move forward in that respect. And we've also heard important uh, comments on, on, uh, on the EPPO. Substantive uh, rules, uh, the PIF directive, and the question of the relationship with Olaf. In connection with this last point, uh, I would uh, sort of say that we talked about the relationship with the body, where which is not uh, mentioned under Article 86 uh, of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union, the body which is quoted in Article 86 uh, with respect to the relationship with Olaf is Eurojust and not uh, Olaf, but whoever deals uh, with this type of questions for many years uh, uh, is well aware that one of the crucial point uh, for EPPO work it's not just the relationship with Eurojust, but far more the relationship with Olaf. In that uh, who is uh, conducting actual investigations uh, in the same area, which is uh, covered by EPPO, used to be Olaf, while Eurojust act at a coordinating body. Now, as to the PIF, uh, directive in this session coordinated by Catalin Ligeti. We've learned uh, the problems uh, in the adoption of the directive at European level, at a national level. At European level, Lorenzo Salazar has mentioned a very thorny problem of the legal basis. We've been talking about this for years. Uh, well, after attending this meeting, uh, what comes to mind is uh, uh, to consider what would be the scenario, the protection of financial interest, where sort of the basis, the legal basis, be uh, the Article 325. I dealt with the draft directive at the time, and we had uh, written that the legal basis was 325, and someone suggested that there would be a possibility to have a regulation rather than a directive because the 325 doesn't sort of envisage specific constraint, formal constraint. So this is something which I'm still considering because in the near future, there won't be a new law that will deal uh, with the new substantive law. So the question whether the PIF directive was a missed opportunity or uh, not uh, is quite justified. Uh, by the same token, Professor Sicurella uh, said that we should ask the same question with respect to transposition rules uh, uh, that Italy has adopted. It might have been another missed opportunity. We could have uh, re define the new rules, but we have sim simply confined ourselves to transposing the European 
rules with all the problems that it has entailed. For instance, uh, the problem of attempt in tax-related uh, crimes. We have to deal with that because uh, that is covered by the PIF directive and the implementing legislation, enabling legislation has to in include it, but it wasn't done uh, in an orderly manner with respect to the tax-related crimes and offenses. This might raise some problems of constitutionality. We do have the VAT uh, rules for some uh, VAT-related frauds for direct uh, taxes, whilst for direct taxes, we have a different set of rules. And the same has to do with the accountability of uh, entities. Uh, well, uh, so, well the, the, so we're still up against some problems in the way in which this has been uh, taken on board in the, uh, in the current legislation. But this uh, might create problems in terms of uh, uh, how we can identify jurisdiction. This is a very delicate issue and the mechanism envisaged within EPPO for the uh, choice of delegated uh, prosecutors, which is the jurisdiction where the criminal action will be, proceedings will be taken. Well, this uh, aspect of EPPO functioning is a delicate aspect that, uh, well, the defense uh, will have to cope with. But I will look, on the other hand, uh, to some other aspect. It is a mechanism which allows uh, to keep a, a united sort of uh, uh, investigation rather than a fragmented uh, investigation. I do recall, because what happened in 2012, I wrote an article the, well, some uh, strong grounds for the establishment uh, of a uh, European Public Prosecutor's Office, and this was based on a case of uh, agricultural fraud that all have had that concerned uh, Bulgaria and Germany, which in Germany led to the conviction of all the uh, sort of uh, uh, perpetrators that were uh, sort of uh, tried in Germany. In Bulgaria, they were acquitted. They were all acquitted for complicity. They were accused of complicity, but they were acquitted. Well, in the earlier scenario, this uh, possible danger of fragmentation and different outcome for the same conduct was a real risk, an actual risk. There were problems of transferring the evidence from one jurisdiction to another, possibly in Bulgaria. Some of the evidence collected in Germany could not be used. Uh, EPPO hasn't fully settled this problem. True, but uh, the investigation can be a single investigation. So even though I'm aware of the fact that this is a delicate point, uh, I would say that there are some positive uh, implications in what has been achieved. We talked about problems related to the functioning of EPPO. This does not uh, depend uh, on the rules. Uh, well, it partly may be the interpretation of some rules, but to, uh, to a large extent it depends on the historical stage uh, on which we are uh, discussing, uh, well, uh, this is completely new ground. We have to break new ground and we have to create the practices which did not exist in the past. As to what was said by Lorena Batmeyer, who coordinated, who presided over one session, she said that there are a number of legal problems. Luca De Matteis gave us an overview of the various legal problems, inherent legal problems, but also some practical difficulties. Danilo Ceccarelli talked about how delegated prosecutor, European prosecutor, 
should be organized. He talked uh, about uh, how they're organized in Italy, but he also referred to other countries. This is a practical aspect that has a considerable impact. Ingrid talked about the organization of the chambers. And another point, which he felt was very controversial, uh, of how the work uh, had to be allocated to the various European prosecutors to ensure the sort of more or less the same workload for all of them uh, to ensure that the uh, uh, European uh, prosecutor that has only a few cases at central level uh, doesn't work. Uh, Uh, doesn't work at all. Whilst there is a, a decentralized uh, level, there are there is an over the delegated uh, prosecutors are overworked. Thomas Krushna talked about the dialogue with the national authorities in in the framework of the European institutions. Uh, which are interacting with the EPPL. So the EPPL does have a, a political responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the European Parliament, which shouldn't, uh, however, undermine um, EPPL independence. And we've heard that the most controversial and delicate issue has to do with the EPPL staff namely the possibility of having disciplinary procedures. One has got to be very careful about disciplinary procedures because they may be sort of indirectly affect the operational efficiency of EPPO. With the session presided over President Biriteri, we talked about a relationship between EPPO and OLAF. Despite uh, the treaty quotes Eurojust, uh, we have devoted a whole session and we could have a whole conference on the relationship between EPPO and uh, OLAF. As a former member of OLAF, uh, the impression I have is that as we had uh, somehow anticipated, Olaf doesn't know exactly where it stands with respect to EPPO. Uh, now we do have this new regulation that tries to sort of settle some problems, but there are some other aspects which are still very delicate ones. And this is something that was mentioned also when uh, EPPO did not exist and we're only, we were only dealing with national authorities. So we can exclude that Olaf acts as a European uh, judiciary police uh, uh, working uh, for EPPO. We can exclude that possibility because if uh, we wanted to achieve that, well, the, the commission proposal would have been taken on board and the proposal of the commission proposal uh, envisaged a central level, some 40 prosecutors that could have been uh, sort of carrying out uh, investigations for EPPO uh, overseen by the central level at the central office uh, had the opportunity had the possibility of conducting uh, investigation uh, the commission proposal of the time was not uh, taken on board and uh, Olaf has a limited power to conduct the uh, investigation in the regulation It is said that uh, EPPO uses the judiciary police of the individual member states where the investigation should take place. So we can't assume that OLAF acts as judiciary police. OLAF will continue to pursue its work in carrying out uh, administrative investigations, which have a limited, more limited scope uh, with respect to what happened in the past. When the judiciary counterpart were the national sort of judiciary authorities, there was a fragmentation of the reference authority. The national judiciary authority 
uh, were dealing with their own uh, criminal proceedings, not just uh, community frauds, EU frauds. They were a limited uh, portion of the national proceedings. So Olaf was the only office which uh, was supposed to conduct administrative investigations in this area had a raison d'etre and could uh, sort of simulate the judiciary authorities that weren't so eager to conduct such investigations for a number of reasons, obviously. Uh, sometimes the investigations are not considered by the member states as, as very urgent. Well, a public prosecutor or the law enforcement uh, focuses on other kind of of crimes, but all of at the time as its own raison d'etre and a clear identity. Today that we have a judiciary authority that only deals with this uh, uh, crimes, it's the only one that deals with the these crimes and has a sort of a scope which is similar to that of Olaf. The impression I get is that uh, Olaf has to reposition itself uh, in the studies that were made in preparation of the drafting of the regulation, some felt that all of at some point should no longer be there with the establishment of EPPL. The regulation had not uh, envisaged a discontinuation of the uh, all of uh, the anti fraud office, but there is a practical risk of overlap. Uh, uh, Olaf's activity will sort of uh, uh, still include the question of the transfer of evidence from the administrative level to the uh, criminal level, and th that has to do with the PPO. We've got to be careful because the transfer of evidence from the administrative level to the criminal level, it's a very delicate one. And that guarantees are not the same, even though the Olaf regulation has a uh, gradually sort of uh, achieve the, the, the traits of the guarantees and visage for uh, criminal investigations. So if I have to have an administrative investigation that has more or less the same guarantees of a criminal investigation, uh, it would be far better to have sort of the criminal investigation uh, rather than having a two-tier system. Well, actually, I'm quite happy that all of this up and running and, and I'm still very close to it uh, and its work and its uh, raison d'etre uh, still exists uh, for those uh, investigations concerning member states that do not belong to EPPL, for investigations with countries of the European Union that are not part of the EPPL but were Also for third countries, Dr. Bianchi mentioned customs related uh, investigation. Uh, this is something which is not uh, uh, covered very often, but this is very important work. So the possibility that Olaf has to obtain evidence uh, from faraway countries which go beyond the legal framework of the European Union, but still a major sort of value added. This is uh, represented by uh, investigations where the, Olaf uh, would have to use uh, letters rogatory uh, to, to get the necessary uh, evidence. So Olaf, as I said, is still very useful, playing a useful role, even though the problem of of uh, trial guarantees uh, still standing. Uh, and this is something that will be sort of uh, settled in time. There would, should be a, a specific agreement to that effect between EPPO and OLAF. Well, for, for a suspect which is under investigation, you know, sort of, uh, this is a very delicate uh, issue, the transfer of evidence, because the person who is um, object of the investigation has to cope, cope with what what uh, is being done in the investigation. Well, the, uh, I have the impression that uh, 
there is a lot which is happening. So we are going through a very interesting stage in this process, in the evolution of the EU criminal law. And there will be future developments to that, uh, of course. Well, uh, there are a number of uh, issues that still have to be clarified. And uh, have a personal recollection, which I'd like to share with you on that. Uh, this is a special sort of uh, date for me because it's a 30th uh, year that I've been working for the judiciary. So the 7th and the 8th of October were the days when I first uh, sort of acted uh, as a in a uh, uh, judiciary office. If I had been told at that time, 30 years ago, that uh, today we would have been uh, involved uh, in discussing uh, the stab, uh, the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which had been established, I would have never believed that. What well, 30 years later, we are discussing about something which is up and running and exists, EPPO. So this is something that should be given great uh, value. As I said, uh, we are uh, halfway along the road. Uh, we, there's a long way to go, but uh, uh, there's something which I say normally when I go to conferences of this nature, even before lawyers. I don't know whether if we want to solve uh, many of the problems, it wouldn't be better to assume that there will be a sort of a core uh, number of uh, uh, criminal rules of uh, EU level. I wouldn't talk in terms of a code of criminal procedure uh, at the EU level, but also for the guarantees of the those who are under investigation. If we had a, a, a common core of uh, rules, of, of criminal rules, would be better. So even uh, in this specific area of the protection of financial interest uh, would enable us to create uh, a common area for uh, criminal justice, something which is uh, something that we are hope to achieve. We'll see what will happen in the future. And hopefully we will meet again on another occasion uh, I was asked uh, to give you some practical indications uh, before we uh, say farewell and we draw this to a close. Uh, there is a farewell coffee which is being served in the courtyard where we had lunch. So I, I thank you and uh, that uh, draws the meeting to a close.